My first Christmas away at college was a sort of sordid, lonely affair. I didn't have the money to go home and spend Christmas with my family. My college did allow students to stay over in their dorm rooms during holiday break, though. This meant that I stayed in my room for the entire five weeks between the two semesters. Obviously, not a whole lot of other students did this. This meant that the huge, normally packed campus was basically turned into a winter wasteland. You know, I actually had a lot of problems during this break. I've actually shared a few of them before, but I haven't shared this one yet. First off, I was drinking quite a lot during this time. I didn't really think too much about it, though. I was in college, and it wasn't like it was hurting anyone, so I just did it. My personal drink of choice was vanilla vodka. I can't count how many days and nights I walked down to the store in order to grab some. On Christmas Eve, I was feeling particularly lonely, and I really didn't have much to drink on me. Not only that, I realized the liquor store would be closed on Christmas Day. To be honest, I was surprised that with so few students on campus that the store was even open on Christmas Eve as well. I decided to walk down to the store. Now, if any of you have ever been on a large campus or in a big city when it didn't have many people around, it's a very strange and surreal experience. It kind of makes you a little bit more wary of whatever or whomever you do happen to see. When I walked into the store, I noticed that there was someone leaning against the outside. I was horrified, thinking it must be a homeless man, especially because of just how cold it was outside. I mean, just the wind chill had to be below zero. I went into the store and bought my stuff. Then, when I came out, I observed the guy a bit more closely. The side of the store was an alleyway that he happened to be sitting in. I could tell he was breathing, so he was still alive, thankfully. I really wished I could do something to help him. I felt bad for buying the vodka when I didn't really have money to give, and I could have given him some. I decided to walk home, but it wasn't long before I turned around and looked back at the store. I was feeling a bit bad. I noticed that the guy on the side of the door had gotten up, though. Not only that, but he had begun walking in the direction that I was walking in. I started to get a little bit nervous, especially so when he crossed the street and was on the same side as me now. I began to wonder if he had done that on purpose, because now it was clear he was following me, and I couldn't really think of any good reason to do that. The walk back wasn't a short one either. As I kept on going, I looked back at the guy as he made it obvious he was following me. I didn't assume he was a student either, because he certainly did not look like one. He was battered in old and dirty clothes, which I had noticed when he was sitting against the store. He smelled quite bad, too. Anyway, he took every single turn that I took, even ones that didn't lead me directly back to my campus dorm. So, there was no doubt he was following me. Now, when we got closer to it, there was a small way I took to get there. I would cut behind this building, walking on earth rather than sidewalk. There were a lot of trees back there, so it was not the most ideal place to walk when someone was following you, but it would cut a few minutes off the travel time. When I got through there, I was in more of an open spot. There was also a light right above as I got back onto the sidewalk. I went to look back again, and at that point I saw the man once more. This time, though, I saw him standing in the light, or really the first time. He was walking a little bit arched over, theatrically swinging his arms back and forth. He seemed to be wearing a Santa hat, and I noticed it looked like he didn't have any hands. It looked like he had hooks instead. In a normal situation, I think that wouldn't bother me much. I mean, I even once worked with a disabled guy who had two hooks for hands because he thought it looked cool, but this situation was a bit different. This guy was obviously following me and was swinging those hooks back and forth in what looked like an aggressive manner. Not knowing what else to do, I took off running, and I ran as fast as I could. I didn't even worry I might slip on the ground because of the ice. I did almost fall forward a couple of times, but thankfully I managed to hold my footing. I sprinted all the way back to the dorm, taking out my card to open the door, 
I fumbled with it and realized why people from horror movies might fumble with their cards so much. I did manage to get inside and quickly shut it behind me. Looking back, I noticed the man was still out there, but now he had stopped pursuing me. Instead, he was just kind of standing there, a bit far back from the entrance. He was just staring at me. I kept on watching him. Finally, he lifted one of his hooked hands, waved it at me like he was telling me goodbye, and then turned and slowly walked away. I never saw that hooked man again. I don't know if he was wanting to rob me or hurt me, or if he was even just screwing with me because he thought it was funny. I mean, the situation was really out there. I could absolutely believe it was a man who happened to have two hooked hands that really wanted to mess with me. I don't know, but it was terrifying when it happened. I went back to my dorm room and had a whole lot of vanilla vodka to celebrate that Christmas Eve. This happened on Christmas Eve, when I was about 13 years old. I'm not going to list any names of places because I live in a different country, and I prefer to be anonymous. I had an uncle that long before I was born was suspected of killing four people quite brutally in a small house in the town that my family lived in. Even though he was found not guilty, it was really the opinion of almost everyone that he in fact was so he became a bit of a boogeyman in that area, especially with the kids. Now, I didn't grow up in that town, though. This was my dad's side of the family, and he'd moved away to go to school and settled down in the town that he went to school in. We normally went to my mom's family for the holidays, although the occasional trip to my dad's family was not unheard of. This year, we decided to go to his. I did always enjoy going there, especially because it was such a rare thing. On Christmas Eve, though, my parents needed something from the local market and sent me to go grab it. It was extremely cold outside, but that didn't really bother me. What bothered me more was just how dark it was, mostly because I was walking around in an unknown town. It was weird and creepy. It was especially quiet outside, likely due to everyone being home with their family. Now, I was familiar with the house that the murders supposedly took place in. My uncle was someone I didn't know very well either. I'd only met him a few times and not very long for each. He wasn't at the celebration this year either. Some of the older kids were walking around outside and saw me as I stopped by the market. After I walked out and went on my way home, they all began to follow me. I wasn't really that worried because even though they were older than me, they were just kids, you know? I had no reason to believe they were up to anything bad. So it was that I was walking down the street, and actually, after a while, I heard the steps behind me begin to speed up. I turned around and saw the four kids were running at me pretty quickly. I didn't know what to do, so I kind of just got stuck there like an idiot. I had never been bullied before or anything like that, and I didn't know any of these guys either. I didn't think something like that could happen to me randomly. When the kids came closer, one of them pulled out a knife. They demanded I hand over any money I had on me to them. Nowadays, I would probably just hand it over right away, but around this time I was young and stubborn and very determined not to. Instead, I walked slowly up to the four boys with a grim grin upon my face, as a wonderful idea occurred to me. I think the boys were very taken aback by me walking toward them, as they just kind of stared at me. I stopped in front of them and asked, You know who my uncle's name is, right? Yeah, of course, why? One of the boys replied. And you know what he did to that family in that house, huh? They indeed did. Well, that's my uncle, and if you know what he did to them, what do you think he'll do to you if you hurt me? I had never seen anyone turn as pale as those four boys in that moment. They didn't even hesitate. They turned around and began screaming and sprinting off down the street. I assumed they believed me, because who would ever admit to being related to someone who had done something so awful?
I used to be the manager of a small store that was actually in a pretty large shopping area. I don't want to go into that much detail about that particular store because although I don't work there anymore, they still exist. At the time though, I was very often the closing manager of this store. This year, I volunteered to work on Christmas Eve. We were busy as all hell, but I always liked those busy days because they kept me so busy. We didn't close early and were actually open until around 11 p.m. The moment we closed though, I let the other employees go home for the last hour of Christmas Eve. I had nowhere to go myself though, really so I went and did some paperwork in the manager's office. After a while, I heard some sort of thumping seeming to be coming from in front of the store. Wondering what was going on, I got up and went to go take a look. I have to admit, I was feeling a bit shocked when I saw a man fully dressed up as Santa Claus standing at the front door of the store. It seemed he was the one thumping on the door. I slowly walked over, but no matter if he was dressed like Santa, I was not just going to open it up like that. I asked the man what he wanted. Let Santa in, he said slowly. Let Santa in, it's Christmas. I'm not letting you in, I told him. He seemed like he was very drunk. I had never seen a drunk Santa before, so it was a really weird experience. I want to come in, it looks so nice in there. I bet you're going to be nice too. He paused for a moment, and when I didn't respond, he began to beat harder on the door, demanding I let him in or else. Scared, I turned and ran to the office to call the police. I stayed in the office until they showed up. The man was no longer at the store at that point. The police didn't even go and look for him, which I guess I did understand. I mean, he didn't successfully manage to break in, or do anything but put a small dent in the door. Fortunately, they walked me to my car still, and one of them even drove with me to my house. It was very nice, because I was expecting to see that Santa pop up out of nowhere. I expected to see him in the back seat of my car or something, or maybe hiding back at my apartment. None of that happened, though. I was able to have a pretty decent Christmas, too once I was able to shake off the nervousness of what had happened. I've been having a problem with one of my neighbors, and it's been very, very irritating. I live in a neighborhood where people don't take very good care of their pets. I mean, there are all sorts of cats just wandering around, I name them even because I see them all the time. Often, I'll even coax them to come over and let me pet them a bit. I'm a firm believer though that cats should be indoor pets, because then they'll lead longer and healthier lives. This is not about cats though, although the neighbors I am talking about do have some cats. The kind that like to sit right in the middle of the road and wait to annoy car drivers. That kind of thing. Those neighbors have a lot of animals. They even have a goat. But the most interesting are their dogs. They have a ton of dogs. A few of them are actually wonderful. They fill you with such joy if you see them. But they have these two dogs in particular that I absolutely hate. And I'll tell you the story of why now. One day, I just happened to be walking to the store. I had just walked down my driveway... I had been outside for less than a minute when this medium-sized black dog came sprinting out of their yard. I had never seen this animal before, and I never back away from dogs. The dog ran up to me, and as usual, I just kept on walking. Yet as I did so, it ran straight up to me and took a bite out of my leg. I was surprised as the dog ran off. I didn't retaliate in any way, but I did confront the owners about it. I didn't want to call animal control because I knew they would have put the dog down. I didn't want an innocent animal to be put down just because it had bad owners. However, as I'm sure you can guess, even telling them this, they did not do anything. They wouldn't even give me a paper to show the dog had a rabies shot. It was horrible. Worst of all, they began to not put the dog on a leash anymore. Because of this, I grabbed this iron rod that had been sitting on my porch, and I began to carry it in my messenger bag. 
just in case that dog came at me again. And guess what? It did. It happened quite often, actually. The dog would always run right at me, trying to corner me. For the first time ever, I actually backed off from the dog. I was worried I would get bitten again. I swung the rod at the dog a few times, and eventually it did go away. I don't want to hear anything from dog lovers who think I was doing a bad thing. This was a dog I had spared the life of several times. I've even had a friend who had his dog get put down simply because of it chasing someone, not even any bites. So every time this dog came at me, I did my best to defend myself without hurting it too much. I did mention before that these neighbors were odd. There always seemed to be a new animal or some other that was showing up. I did tell you about the goat, but there was a much worse animal that eventually arrived. They got another aggressive dog, a much larger black one. One day, as usual when I was walking, this time both of the dogs came at me. I got really scared as they barked and growled and chased and nipped at me. Like a moron, this time I had forgotten to bring the rod with me because I hadn't seen the other dog in a few weeks. These two dogs were very scary. Their barks were so angry, they chased me into someone's yard and even up against the fence. They really wanted to bite me. Then a car drove by and scared them away. I tried to find something else to protect myself with after that and found something I could easily carry with me whenever I left the house. The last incident happened when I went to do my Christmas shopping one evening. Not too long ago, actually. It was very cold and a bit icy outside. That was when I liked to go out, though. I hadn't seen those dogs in a while at this point. Right when I reached the edge of the neighborhood, though, I could hear that distinct barking, and those two dogs came sprinting out of the dark at me. I got scared and tried to move away, but I slipped on the ice and fell. The smaller dog began to growl and advance on me. Just before it could bite into my neck, there was this incredibly loud electric sound. That dog that was about to bite me was laying on the ground whimpering. The bigger dog, terrified at that noise, turned around and ran off. Slowly, I got up to my feet, wary of that dog laying on the ground. I never wanted to hurt him, and I know his aggression was more the fault of his owner than him. But I had bought a stun gun to protect myself. And protect me, it did. I didn't see the dogs in the following days, and I wonder if they'll leave me alone from now on. So two nights ago, my mom received a phone call from an unrestricted number talking about some seriously messed up stuff. She called me to come and get her, so I'll pretty much lay out everything that happened. At 3.38 in the morning, I got a text from my mom asking if I was still up. I replied yes and was curious as to what she could possibly want. It was a work night for her and she was always one to go to bed early. My father's a firefighter and it was a night he was on shift, so I knew he was not home. Less than a minute later after I replied, she called me, so I answered it and could tell she was very upset immediately. Crying, actually. She was asking me to come pick her up from home, since I only lived two streets away from her. It would take me at most two minutes to drive to her house. Well, of course I immediately said yes. I threw in my Bluetooth speaker thing I had and started getting dressed. I grabbed one of my pistols and proceeded out my door. I grabbed it because I was still unsure what the situation was. As I was rushing to get ready, I repeatedly asked her what was wrong. She told me that at about 3.28, she'd gotten a phone call from a restricted number and answered the phone since it had woken her up. Upon answering, some guy just started talking a voice she didn't recognize at all. She was unclear what he'd initially started saying when she picked up, since she was still out of it from just waking up. When finally alert, she said the man had told her he was babysitting a nine-year-old girl named Ashley earlier on, and when she was on the couch with him, he'd done stuff to her, basically admitting to molesting her. Obviously, my mom was completely blindsided by what she was hearing and immediately started asking who she was speaking to. Was this some kind of sick prank call? She told the person to never call her again and hung up immediately. 
Immediately after she hung up, the restricted number called back and tried to talk to her again. Again, she stated this had better not be some sick prank and hung up once more. After a third call of saying a bunch of creepy stuff again, my mom wasn't too sure what to do. She was very uncomfortable though. She headed to the kitchen to turn on all the house lights and grab one of her knives. Again, she hung up. After the fourth call though, she was fed up. She just told him straight from the start, Listen up, I'm done playing your games. I'm gonna call the cops. Who the fuck is this? The man became very angry. No, you listen up. I'm not here to answer your questions. You're here to listen to me. Now, you're gonna stay on the line and listen to everything I did to this girl, because otherwise I'm going into her room, and I'm gonna do it again. My mom hung up again. That's when she texted and called me, and stayed on the line with me, as I was quickly getting ready to head over there. While on the line, the man called a fifth time. My mom ignored this call, though. It turned out he left a voicemail. Well, on the way there, he continued to call over and over. At this point, my mom was not answering anymore. That's when I pulled up to the side of her home. I'm not sure if this is some weird coincidence or not, but as I was about two or three houses down from hers, about to pull up, the person suddenly stopped calling. That being said, I was still around the corner, so I don't know if I would have been in sight yet when they stopped. She jumped into my car, and we drove down to the police station. I'm also a firefighter for the city, so I knew a cop working and knew I'd rather bring all this up to him as opposed to just calling 911 raw. We get there and explained everything to him, and my mom told him about the voicemail as well. She didn't want to listen to it and asked the cop if he could instead maybe get a sense of what my mom was talking about. The cop listens to it and said it was about 15 seconds long. Says, yeah, you don't want to listen to that. Anyway, I asked if it was possible to trace that restricted number, since I thought you could. He said he didn't think you could, though. He went back and grabbed his supervising officer to get his input on what should be done. Unfortunately, there was not really anything that could be done. He asked my mom if she recognized either the man's voice or knew a little girl named Ashley. My mom said no. Therefore, there wasn't really any way or any reason to get a detective involved. He also suggested there was a strong possibility this was just some guy fabricating this whole story because that's how this weirdo got off. Just a crazy coincidence that out of any random number this dude could have called it happened to be my mom's. The officer said best case scenario, my mom's cell phone provider could likely trace the call and see who the number belonged to. They assured us though that most likely the phone company would absolutely not give us this info unless we had orders from a judge. Basically, we just filed our report. I brought my mom home and waited until my dad got home from work in the morning. Has anyone ever heard of something like this before? Should I try to get a hold of the phone company and see what info I can get? I'm sure it would put my mom at ease if the number was from a few states over, as opposed to a local number. I don't know, it just seems weird to try and brush this whole thing off and hope they never call my mom again. The way I see it, if someone makes a bomb threat to a school, which is usually always just some kid or someone not serious at all, it's always treated as if it's true and becomes a huge ordeal. So why not treat a phone call of a little girl being molested in the same category? I don't know what I should do. When I was little, around seven years old, I lived with my mom and my sister. We had different dads, but the same mom. My mother and father had separated a couple of years before and lived apart. My dad lived about two hours away, and I saw him every other weekend. Since the separation, my mom had gone on various dates with different men, but they all never really worked out. At this point, I would just like to mention that my mom drank a lot of alcohol, she had a very hard life and alcohol had always been her way to cope with it. I've made peace with that since then, and she's a lot better off today. One morning, I remember waking up and going to my mum's room to see a strange man in bed with her. Nothing unusual, I guess, just another date I'd probably never see again. However, since that date, 
John never really left our lives, and he and my mom ended up dating for quite a bit. John was actually very nice at first. He would let me and my sister, who was six years older than me, stay at his house when my mom did, and he would give us lots of sweets as well. Eventually, though, I can't really remember when, but John began to become very abusive. Honestly, I was so young, it all feels like a blur now. I can only recall bits and pieces of information, but I remember him and my mom getting into arguments all the time. He would smash stuff around the house, and even sometimes strike at my mom too. Later on, I learned he did stuff like rip my mom's earrings out and hold a samurai sword to her throat even. Every time they would get into a fight, he would leave at stupid times like 3am. My mom would leave a bit later to go after him, I presume. This would leave my sister, then 13, to look after me and get me ready for school. After school, I would walk out to see both John and Mom in the car waiting for me, and I would feel dread because I knew he would still be in our lives. You would think all of that would be the creepy part, but no. You see, John was also in an organization for men. I don't want to say the name of it here because of anonymity, but it was all very secretive stuff. He was never allowed to talk about what happened at their meetings to my mom or us. Women were not allowed to join either. The only time women could join events was the annual ladies event that they often held, which my mom would go to as well. Around the same time, my nan got into a relationship with a man named Kenny. Kenny also was a part of this organization it turned out, and he and John were very friendly with each other. My mom now strongly believes that they both knew each other before they'd ever met my nan or my mom. Kenny was also very abusive towards my nan as well, to the point that he even knocked some of her teeth out once. Kenny and John's friendship suddenly came to an end one night when my mom and John were visiting my nan and Kenny, while me and my sister were visiting our dads. My mom remembered she was offering to make Kenny a roast dinner for tomorrow. She went to the toilet, and when she came back, she overheard the conversation between Kenny and John become very heated. Before she could even find out what was going on, she felt two punches to the neck. John pushed her and yelled at her to run, and when she turned, she saw Kenny stabbing John eight times. Somehow, they escaped out the front door with my nan, and it was only then that my mom realized she had been stabbed in the back of the neck twice. Eventually, the police turned up and Kenny was arrested, while my mom and John were taken to the hospital. Luckily, they both survived. We never did find out the reason why Kenny became so suddenly hostile and stabbed everyone, but I wouldn't be surprised if it had something to do with this organization they shared. We never saw Kenny again after the court case ended, but we believe he got put into a psychiatric hospital. Apparently, he pleaded that a mental illness had pushed him to stab them. After Kenny was gone, my nan, who had schizophrenia, came to stay with us for a while, until she felt safe and mentally sound to go home. I think Kenny really did a number on her, because she was never quite right after that. Now for the creepiness part two. Despite Creeper Kenny now being gone, John was still around, which didn't make my life any easier. He made life hell for us after instead. Constantly getting angry, hitting my mom, getting angry at me and my sister. Once I accidentally dropped and broke a pot of mustard on the floor, I remember my mom and I just freezing because we were so terrified at how John would react. My sister, being a bit older at the time, remembered a lot more of the creepy things she caught him doing as well, such as sitting on my bed wistfully one night when I was away at my dad's. When she asked him what he was doing, he'd say, where else would I be? She once walked in on my mom crying. When she asked what was wrong, John just told her, a 16-year-old, your mom was raped. Me and my mom would have to go on walks at midnight around the neighborhood if we made him angry, and my sister can't quite remember why. But once she was so terrified and upset at John, she ran out of the house barefoot and ran all the way to her dad's, which was a 10-minute walk away. When she arrived at his house, John was already waiting there. That fucked my sister up, because she left the house before John did and sprinted to her dad's. The only way he would have made it there before her was if he ran too. My mom became very strange and weird during her time with John, doing things she had never done before, as if she was having a mental breakdown. At the time, we believed it was just because John was abusive and because of the alcohol. 
In recent years, though, she's admitted to us that she believes John was drugging her at the time. She even ended up marrying him overnight with only two witnesses, both from the secret organization. You can clearly see her looking very drugged out in the wedding photos, and we only found out they were married a week later. She never felt right in her time with him, and told us that whenever she went to the ladies' nights, she would not remember anything about the night in the slightest. I remember one night John made the creepiest comment towards my sister when she was around 13. They were talking about that mysterious ladies' night. He said, Now that you're old enough to participate, we'll buy you a pretty dress and you can come with us and see. My sister told us that when he said that, she felt so uncomfortable she hated the idea of it immediately and completely refused outright. He made the same comment to me too when I turned 10, saying that when I was a bit older I could finally go. I remember being so excited about buying a dress and being able to go to this secret club my mom often went to. After learning though about how nobody ever remembered this ladies night, I'm so glad I never got the chance to go. I was 11 once when I woke up to the sounds of my mom screaming. John had just passed away. He was diabetic but was terrible at managing his insulin levels. He died from too much fluid he collecting in his lungs. That was both the worst and best day of my life. I would never wish anyone dead, but when John passed away finally, I felt a huge weight lift off my chest. What an awful thing for an 11-year-old to feel. I shiver whenever I think about what our lives might still be like if he was alive. I wonder if we would have even survived. I was always the weird kid growing up, so making friends was never very easy for me. I was a bit of a punk in high school, so living in a preppy religious town was my idea of hell. Eventually, I met this boy named Sean. I was so happy to finally have someone I connected with. We very quickly became best friends and hung out nearly every day. He was very odd, but so was I so I was able to look past it. Notably, most of the time when we would hang out, we were also on drugs, so I figured some of the weird stuff he said must have just been the drugs talking. One day, though, he just randomly said, Hey, I'm gonna stab someone this week. Four days later, he threatened to shoot up our school on Instagram. He played it off as a joke when I confronted him about it, but when the school confronted him, they took it much more seriously. He was taken into custody by the police, but not charged with anything somehow. His parents also took away his phone and forced him to move away for a few weeks to let the air clear out, but we kept in contact in the meantime. Around this point, my dumb self realized I was in love with him. I did everything I could to clear his name. I even got into arguments with parents on Facebook. My parents begged me to stop talking to him. But for some reason, I truly believed he was good. I didn't want to believe he was really capable of hurting anyone. The whole shooting thing never really blew over, though. When he came back to school, students would run away from him in the hallways. People would send him threats at all times. His reputation was completely ruined. After this, something in him changed. He was a lot angrier. We would be talking and joking around about some random thing when all of a sudden he would just start attacking me with words. I'd tell him about a boy I was talking to and he'd call me a whore, or if I made any new friends he'd go out of his way to ruin my new friendships. For some reason, he did this in a way that I saw it as him being supportive. About a year went by after this. The verbal abuse continued and I continued to do nothing about it. I was still in love with him after all but I didn't act on it since he was my closest friend. And to keep my mind off Sean for a while, I started dating this guy named Alex. Sean hated him, not for any particular reason or anything. He just didn't like that I spent time with someone that was not him. Alex was also a weed dealer, and Sean knew this. Sean asked if Alex would front him some weed since he knew we were best friends, and Alex did so. I don't remember the exact amount, but it was a decent chunk. Enough to be mad about if you didn't get paid back for it. Well, of course, Sean never paid him back. Alex tried to talk to him about it, 
but Sean always put him off and avoided him. After about a month of this, Alex saw Sean's car in a Taco Bell parking lot and pulled up. He saw Sean in his car and began to get out. Since Alex had anger issues, he also pulled his baseball bat along with him. Sean saw him and freaked out. He pulled out of his parking spot quickly, drove off and called 911. Alex was then arrested for assault with a deadly weapon. Three days later, when Alex got out of jail, he was driving to his friend's house when he saw Sean standing in his front yard. He rolled down his window and called him a pussy, then drove away. Sean called the police again, and Alex was arrested for stalking this time. Around this time, my parents had caught me smoking. I didn't want to lie anymore, so I was honest about everything. Obviously, they were mad at me for getting myself into the situation. I had just told them that I was smoking weed and dating a drug dealer, so I was in a pretty fair amount of trouble. My parents took my phone away as soon as I got home from school. I wasn't allowed to see Alex when he got out of jail, and they took my paychecks as well, so I wouldn't use all my money to buy weed. They also made me download a tracker on my phone so they could make sure I was home when they weren't. They contemplated calling Sean's parents too and telling them we had been smoking together. I knew that if Sean got caught smoking again, he would get kicked out of his house, so I snuck my phone and texted him my parents might call his. He was extremely pissed. He called me all kinds of horrible names and said he wished he had never even met me. I'd finally had enough at that point. I told him not to talk to me ever again. My parents never did end up calling his parents, though. After that, we pretty much didn't talk at all anymore. I asked not to be scheduled with him at work and avoided him at all costs at school. We didn't have any classes together either, so it wasn't too hard. But hearing the stuff he'd started to say about me made me find it a little bit difficult. He had started rumors I was addicted to coke, stuff about me selling nudes. This is when the text started. He began texting me constantly, so I blocked his number. Then, he'd use someone else's phone to text me instead. So, I'd block that number as well. Then, he'd use WhatsApp or Group Me, since we used those for work. So, I blocked him on there, too. He eventually got fired from our job because he had been writing tips on receipts if people didn't ask for a copy of their receipt and left the tip line empty. The messages got even more furious for the next few weeks. I just continued to block anyone he was associated with. I didn't want to be in contact with him whatsoever. He kept making these new Instagram accounts to message me on, though, but all of his attempts to contact me failed. One day, I had a late lesson at School of Rock, where I took guitar lessons. My teacher had stayed late for me, so I was expecting his car to be the only one still in the lot, but it wasn't. There were two cars sitting there, my teacher's and Sean's. To this day, I don't even knew how he knew I was going to be there. I quickly parked, locked my doors, and thought about what to do. I then realized he was not in his car. I calmed down a bit and called inside to ask if he was there, but he wasn't. I cautiously got out of my car and grabbed my guitar, then walked inside with no problems. After my lesson, though, I came outside to see that he was now parked right next to me, waiting for me to get into my car. When he saw me, he began screaming profanities at me. He just stood there screaming at me. I quickly climbed into my car from the passenger door, so I didn't have to walk next to him. Then I drove home as fast as I could. After that, he began asking people to ask me to talk to him at school. Of course, I didn't. Each time someone mentioned his name to me, it caused me to have a panic attack so bad I'd have to leave school. I ended up missing the entire month of November, then switching to an online school. About a month after I did this, I was driving with a friend to pick up food for my mom. As soon as we pulled into the drive-thru, the car behind me began to flash their brights at me. I looked in my rearview mirror, only to see Sean's car right there. He had this identifying sticker across the top of his windshield, so I knew it was him right away. I looked over at my friend in fear. I didn't want to scare you, so I didn't say anything, but he's been following us since we left Target. I panicked and just pretended not to notice him. He then pulled out of the drive-thru and parked right next to it by the exit. As soon as I pulled out, so did he. I sped to my friend's house, dropped her off, and went straight home. At this point, my parents thought going to the police with everything would be the smartest thing to do. An officer came over to my house and took a statement. 
I showed him screenshots of every message he'd sent over the past months, and my friend that was in the car with me in the drive-thru talked to the police officer as well. We decided not to press charges, but we did decide to file an incident report. Days went by and I didn't hear anything else from him. I thought maybe it was over and I could finally move on with my life, but my dad told me Sean had messaged him on Facebook. He was saying all sorts of things like I was addicted to pills and that I had even stolen money from my dad to buy more. I've never done pills in my life. I'm a hippie, so I stick to natural drugs. My parents know this, so they screenshotted the messages and sent them to the police as well. The police stopped by his house to tell him to stop contacting me. I continued to get messages from random Instagram accounts, and sometimes I'd see his car behind me random places. Each time I'd write down the location, date, and time I saw him. At this point, I started to work with Alex's lawyers to prove Sean wasn't this innocent victim he was pretending to be. Eventually, Alex's charges were dropped as well. Sean had been proven unreliable when I came forward with my story. I wish I could say I had an ending to all this, but I don't. I still get random messages from him, but I don't bother to screenshot them anymore. Since I switched to online school, I was able to graduate a year early. Because of that, I moved away for college, so I don't worry about him following me everywhere anymore. Last I heard about him was that he got arrested just a few months ago. I've never posted anything here before. This kind of feels tame, I guess, compared to some of the other things on here, but it still haunts me to this day. This actually happened when I was a teenager, around 14 or 15 years old and in high school. I had a boyfriend at the time who lived a fairly short walk away from the school. We would often go to his place after school ended and hang out for a few hours before I'd walk home. Because we took the same route so often, I knew all of the houses and landmarks along the way. In January, I live in the north so the winter is pretty cold and snowy. My boyfriend and I started to notice a car had been parked in the same spot for a suspiciously long time. We thought nothing of it at first. Maybe the car had just died in the cold and whoever owned it couldn't afford to have it towed and repaired. But as spring came and went and the snow finally melted, the car was still there parked in the same spot at the end of my boyfriend's street. We passed it almost every day as we walked there after school, and as the days grew warmer, a rotten stench started to rise from the car. I began to joke with my boyfriend. You know, I bet there's a body in that trunk. We laughed it off together, but we were curious now. One day, we peered inside the car windows as we passed. The car was extremely messy, but not filled with trash or food. A discarded backpack lay across the seat, and papers were strewn about here and there. It looked like any other ordinary car, except we knew it hadn't moved for months now. The smell was indescribable. This smell continued to get worse and worse as the spring turned into summer. One day, when I couldn't come over for some reason, my boyfriend and his dad decided to finally investigate this car. When they did so, they found that the doors were unlocked and the keys were still left inside. That was pretty strange. They went around to the back and popped open the trunk. My boyfriend told me that a swarm of black flies immediately flew up from inside. That smell was definitely coming from the truck. Inside were a collection of black garbage bags. My boyfriend and his dad decided to call the cops at this point. The cops later told us that inside of those bags was rotting meat cut into pieces. The first pieces they tested belonged to a pig, but a few weeks later, my boyfriend's dad got another call. Under that pig meat were the bones of a human child. Whoever left that car sitting unlocked with the keys inside was obviously hoping it would be stolen. It still gives me the shivers. This story is from a few years ago, probably 2009 or 2010 just about. I was in college at the time, and I used to drive a little manual two-door. 
It had a back seat, but if you were over five foot six, it was basically impossible to sit in comfortably. I was walking out of a big box store one night when I saw this disheveled woman in complete hysterics outside. She was claiming her boyfriend had taken her paycheck to go get high, and now she couldn't get home. Uh, excuse me, where's home? I asked. She answered it was in a town that was probably about 20 minutes away, but for me, it wasn't that far out of the way to help a crying random lady. During the car ride there, she began to act more and more fidgety. She told me about her history of drug abuse and her abusive druggy boyfriend, how she probably wouldn't even be able to pay rent, all sorts of things like that. Meanwhile, we're driving out to more and more secluded parts of town, and the drive is taking longer and longer. About halfway through this drive, she mentioned she also has a host of mental illnesses, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder. Now I'm beginning to wonder about the truth of her story. Whatever, I guess that explains the fidgeting if she just got done with a panic attack, adrenaline and whatnot. Finally, after 40 minutes of driving, we reached this house with no lights on and no cars there. She told me she lived with her kids and her mom. She starts to fumble around to hand me money for gas. I told her not to worry about it because my mileage was fine and she said she needed to pay her rent. She hesitated then. I'm not sure if she hesitated because I was not accepting the money or if she was thinking of doing something else. But here I was alone in the middle of nowhere, near this completely empty house. I turned my GPS on with directions to home to indicate I was now going to leave. Pretty quickly, she got out of the car, but she went in a completely different direction, away from that empty house, and wandered off into the woods. I never saw her again. I'm not sure if she was just scared, or if she was trying to lure me out in the middle of nowhere for whatever reason. A part of me really hoped she really was just coming down from a panic attack after getting left in a parking lot by her abusive druggy boyfriend, and she was just jittery because of that. But while it was happening, I definitely started getting a feeling that something was not right. I thought about it a lot before. I've considered that maybe my manual transmission, my GPS having a phone, which was less common in a college town in 2010, or maybe something else changed her mind about doing anything weird to me, if she was considering it. But I guess it's a relatively happy ending that nothing happened. For the last year, I've been having to go to the laundromat at least once a week due to not being able to afford a new washer and dryer up front. It's never really been an issue, until a few weeks ago. I went in one night just as usual, and there was an older gentleman already sitting there. I had never seen him before, but there aren't really the same people when I go usually. At one point, I heard him begin mumbling to himself but there were plenty of people around then, so I wasn't really worried. I walked out the door to my car. He was sitting at a table with his head down. When I got around to the driver's side of my door, I looked up, only to see him standing at the laundromat door, staring right at me. I froze because I was so startled. I even sent my husband a text with a full description of him, just in case. Nothing happened for a while, though. Last week, I was there with my oldest son. The same man was there wearing the same outfit, so I started to wonder a little bit. We were the only three, and my laundry was the only ones being done at the moment. It clicked that maybe he was homeless, and he came in at night to stay warm or something. I left a couple of dollars by the vending machine, and when I was leaving, I heard him getting change and getting a snack. A couple of nights later, I had to go again to wash blankets, and he was there again. After the first occasion though, on these two, I didn't get any further weird vibes from him like that first night, so I wrote it off as a coincidence and decided he was pretty harmless. Tonight, I had to go with my three kids while my husband was helping a friend at his house. When we got there, no one was there but us. We were sitting at the front of the place. My laundry was in the washers at the back, so I went back there to check the washers, I saw it was almost done. I continued around the corner to grab a basket, only to see the homeless man standing right there. I jumped a bit because I hadn't heard anyone come in, 
and he was definitely not there when we had walked inside. I continued past him and walked up to the other side to where my children were sitting. At this point, I could hear what the man was saying to himself. She saw me and got scared and ran off. Ah, he's so stupid. I heard the bathroom door slam shut. Alarm bells were going off now. I quietly hurried my kids to get their stuff gathered up. I considered slipping out the front door that we were sitting by and walking down the alley and around to my car. It was dark and my kids were already getting scared though, so I decided that was not a good idea. Instead, we all held hands and walked straight to the back. I thought he must still be in the bathroom because I hadn't heard him ever come out once again. Once we passed the sitting area in the back though, he was standing right there combing his hair. We continued out the door like we weren't peeing our pants scared. I got all the kids in the car and went around to get in myself. There he was again, standing at the back door, staring at all of us. I quickly got in and locked all the doors and left. I called my husband so I could pick him up as well. We all came back to switch the clothes and wait for them to dry. The man was still there. We put the clothes in the dryer, then went to sit in the car. The man walked out, staring at me the entire time. He did a full two circles around the place, still watching me. My husband went back in once the clothes were dry and said the man was no longer in there. I'm officially creeped out by this now. I plan on only going during the day from now on, and I don't plan on staying if I'm the only one there. Hopefully, by the beginning of the year, I can stop going altogether. Am I being crazy, or is this really creepy? This is going to be kind of long. I worked at a local coffee shop as a barista a few months back for about seven months. I was 19 at the time. Currently, I'm 20 now. My co-workers knew about Gregory, but never paid him much mind. He had a big scar or birthmark on the entire left half of his face. Sometimes he carried around a radio that only played static. He would intently listen to it. He was known to hold up these crazy, the world is ending and you're going to hell signs as well. He was homeless. He would buy these espresso shots with so much honey and just lick the honey directly out of the cup, which was always so gross and unsightly. But he had never been mean and really didn't bother anyone too much. He just really came off as kind of weird with how he spoke and what he said. He was all kind of all over the place. He would jump from one sentence to the next, but somehow it would still be tangible. One night I was working alone, and later closing with my co-worker, who was a very small, petite girl, always smiling and not intimidating at all. It was probably around 7pm. She came in at around 8 or 8.30. As a side note, I'm a trans guy and have short hair and all, but I'm not on hormones yet, so I still kind of look a bit feminine. I had two regulars sat at the bar with me, and it wasn't very full in the lobby at all. In comes Gregory, but this time he seems a bit off, more so than usual anyway. He came up to the register and immediately said something like, Hey, how you doing? I'm here to buy some coffee if I can. If the Lord will let me have one tonight, cause my card may be empty, but if he says so, immediately I was like, okay. I asked him if he wanted the same thing as usual. He just repeated the same sentence to me. Like his sentences were very quick and erratic and on a loop. So I ran his card and it's empty. Oh well, looks like the Lord wants me to go to bed and not have a drink. You know, if the Lord says so, it's the truth, right? <laughs> yeah, sorry Gregory. Uh, by the way, you left your hat in here last time. He cut me off quite aggressively. Oh, I don't need possessions. They don't mean a thing compared to the Lord's love, you know. As long as I got my heart and soul, and as long as you love God and believe in Him, He'll do great things for you, you know, so it's, say, say, wh wh what's your name again? How old are you? You seem young. At this point, when he asked my age, I was weirded out a bit more, but here's where it gets more uncomfortable. He then asked me if I'm married. I initially didn't understand him, so he asked again. I said no, I was not. As soon as I said no, he cut me off and started talking even more erratically and quickly, stuttering over himself. I could barely even listen and hear what he was saying. He told me his full name, his age, which was almost mid-fifties, 
and where and when he was born. He went on to say he had no money but to go to Outback Steakhouse to find this person. He gave me their full name and said he didn't have money right now because he gets his check at the end of the month, but that wouldn't be a problem for us. Obviously, I was super creeped out. Reminder, two regulars at the bar were having a watch and hearing this whole conversation go down as well. I finally decided I needed to ask him to leave. Gregory, please stop. I'm not married, but I do have a boyfriend, and I'm gonna have... I couldn't even finish my sentence. He interrupted me again, raising his voice. Is he gonna commit to you? Is he? If not, you let me know, and I'll take good care of you. He rattled on about how he could never find a woman to be with, also assuming I was a woman myself. I attempted to tell him he needed to leave when he got physically angry. His expression snapped from upset to confused and pissed. He didn't say a word, but in the middle of me talking, he whipped around and walked out the door, slamming it hard against the glass and walking down the sidewalk to leave. Luckily, no one in the lobby really heard much, but the guys at the counter were as shocked as I was. It was my first time experiencing any kind of harassment at work, but that wasn't even the worst part. Another regular, a woman a couple of years older than me, used to work at a lingerie shop and currently works at a diner. I don't really know how we got into it, but she also explained to me an experience she had with Gregory. He had apparently walked into the store and asked angrily why they carried sodomy in this store. He then proceeded to rub the lotions they had all over his face. I learned that he was constantly in and out of jail for trespassing into places he's banned from, including the coffee shop I worked at, which no one even knew he was banned from because he'd been so long. He had some mental issues and handled that by doing copious amounts of drugs. I don't really know what kind of drugs, but Arkansas is the state of meth, and I assume with that kind of behavior, it's what he was working with. The second and possibly worse incident is when the woman I was talking to had a co-worker of hers who met Gregory at the diner. She was opening at 4.30 a.m. with her boyfriend, when Gregory, who was already banned, knocked on the locked door and asked for food. The boyfriend said he needed to leave and go away. Gregory got angry and replied to the girl, How dare you do this to me? Treat me this way. Whatever happens to you next is all your fault. He was later overheard saying that if he got the chance to be alone with her, he would rape her. He's been known to threaten other women with that as well. I was already afraid he would come back later while me and my small and sweet co-worker were working together to get some kind of revenge, but I never expected him to be capable of that. I had to watch my back for the next few months. I saw him once more before I stopped working at that job, and he sent chills down my spine. He just glanced at me with zero expression. I tried to tell my male co-worker, who he treated normally with a creepy smile, not to serve him. I hid in the back and waited until he left. I haven't seen him since, thankfully. I carry a knife now wherever I go. I've never shared this story with anyone. I was always too afraid to be judged for it, so it's something I buried deep down until my friend brought it up just the other day. We both have daughters now, and we're talking about how we could best educate them on being safe when they're teenagers and experimenting with partying. When my best friend and I were 17 years old, we went to the beach for spring break with a couple of our guy friends. My friend was talking to this guy she had met through mutual friends, he wanted us to meet up with him at a house he and his friends had rented together. Our guy friends had long since ditched us to meet girls, so we decided to go ahead and go to her friend's house to hang out with them. When we got there, it was in the middle of the day. He took us inside and introduced us to everyone. Turns out almost all the guys were on a basketball team of the same university. We hung out and they were all drinking. My friend and I were not though. One guy came out with two glasses of what appeared to be whiskey and coke. Against my better judgment, I started to sip it as did my friend. There was one guy who appeared to be not athletic though, and he was the only person at the house who was seemingly not friendly toward us. I'll call him Mike. Suddenly, I started to feel very buzzed. We were laughing and talking, and one guy asked me to put on his jersey. 
I grabbed it and put it on over my clothes. No, take your clothes off and put it on, he said in a very aggressive tone. I was feeling more and more tipsy at this point, and I began to realize something was very wrong. Our parents had let us drink with them multiple times, so I already knew what it was like to be drunk. I knew exactly how much I could handle before getting that way too, and one drink had never made me feel like I was getting wasted. Come on, quit babysitting that drink. Drink up, you weakling, one guy said, and they all laughed. Even though I had already stopped drinking, I could still feel myself getting more and more buzzed, especially since our drink had barely tasted of any whiskey. My dad always had whiskey at home, and we would drink a couple whiskey Pepsis on occasion. I would feel relaxed then, but this was much different. We should go now. Our friends are waiting for us. I headed for the door. A couple of guys moved to stand in front of us. No, 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 you can't leave. Come sit down over here for a little bit. They ushered us back to the couch. That sinking feeling hit my gut, and I knew we were now on borrowed time. I tried to stay calm and laughed, thinking of what to do. I need to pee. Come with me. I grabbed my friend's hand and we went to the restroom together. We both stood there and we had already read each other's minds. I put my hands on her head and looked in her eyes so we could both try our best to focus. We need to leave right now. Our phones both had spotty service all over the island, I'm guessing because there were so many people packed in such a tight space. Take my keys and tell them you're going to get your purse. I'll stay here. You go get the guys and come back for me. I knew this plan probably wouldn't work, but my mind was going crazy. As I opened the bathroom door though, Mike was already standing there. My heart immediately sank. He had been rude to us earlier, and he'd probably just overheard our plan. He leaned in and whispered, Follow me, and be quiet. Something inside me trusted him with everything I had in that moment. We followed him down a hallway into a garage and out through the front driveway. Hurry up! Get out of here now! We ran to the car and I drove off to our hotel. I remember driving sort of, but I don't even remember arriving to our condo. The rest of the story is from our guy friends, telling us what happened. Apparently, we walked in. The guys asked us where we had been, because it was already well into nighttime, and we were supposed to meet up for barbecue for some weenies. They said we didn't even say a word, just walked to our rooms, closed the door, and passed out. We didn't come out till the next day, and both of us had severe headaches, as if we'd drunk a whole bottle of cheap vodka all by ourselves. To the basketball douchebags who tried to take advantage of two teenage girls, let's never meet again, or I will kick you in the dick. And thank you, Mike. I wish I could thank you. I hope you're out there reading this, and you remember the brunette and blonde little girls you saved that day on the island. This takes place over the course of a few years, from just before my university freshman year to just after my junior year. I'm now a 20-year-old female, but at the start of this story, I was 17 years old. For my freshman orientation, my family and I were staying at a hotel right across from my college campus. Orientation started in the morning, so I wandered over to campus with my luggage to check into my dorm room for the next few days. I was roomed alone, at least for orientation, since I have OCD and sleeping problems and I didn't want to bother any potential roommates just moving in. I put my luggage away and began to walk around the campus. This entire fiasco started for one simple reason. That morning I wanted breakfast. It was extremely foggy, and I had never been on this campus before. It was a ways away from my hometown after all, so I very quickly became completely turned around. I spotted a group of four people walking toward a building, so I swallowed up my anxiety and approached them to ask for directions. I should add that I'm a shy and quiet person, so it took a bit before I piped up and, excuse me. One of the four turned around. My immediate thought was, oh my god, this guy looks just like a fish. He had these big creepy eyes and these big fat lips. He was blonde and a little bit chubby. 
This is purely for descriptive purposes, by the way. I'm not exactly a model myself. Still, I stifled my gawking and asked him politely. Uh, excuse me, uh, do you know where the dining hall is? Oh, yeah, it's right there. He motioned to the building directly behind us. Oh, wow, I'm so dumb. There was a small pause before he asked. Are you here alone? As someone who's run into predatory people before, this question never, ever sits well with me. My family will be here later. We all have sleeping problems, so they're catching up on sleep right now. And they'll be here at six, actually. This wasn't a lie, but I hoped it would deter him from latching on to me. Oh, well, do you want to sit with us in the meantime? I guess that he meant the group of four he was in, but the other three had already disappeared into the dining hall. Sure, I conceded. He immediately grabbed a two-person table, which made me internally groan. I had a feeling where this was going, and I already wanted no part of it. I mean, I'm a lesbian for Christ's sake. I didn't want to risk making him angry. I didn't want someone to hate me before the school year had even started. So I sat down with him in a plate of eggs. I tried to make conversation to at least be polite, but he just kept on replying very dryly with things like, Oh, uh-huh, mm-hmm. I thought I had upset this fish face somehow, so I looked up from my plate, only to see him staring directly at my breasts. I'm a 36 double D, so I'm unfortunately used to this. I sighed and bagged out my sweater around my chest. Even after this, and me slouching though, he just kept staring so blatantly. After this, I obviously didn't want anything to do with him. Unfortunately, I was not so lucky. Everywhere I went after that he followed, even if our orientation events were completely separate. I repeatedly tried to give him the slip, becoming increasingly creeped out by his attempts at flirting, but everywhere I went there was a fish face appearing. I gave it one last try, slipping away to the library. That's when the messages started. Somehow this fish face had found my Snapchat. I guess he searched my name somehow. He kept messaging me things like, Where are you? Where did you go? I'm right here. Knowing that he could see I'd read them, I felt obligated to respond. Okay, I'll be there soon, I guess. This didn't stop with orientation, though. The beginning of my freshman year was marred with fish face encounters. Classes, trips to the store, student activities off campus, it really didn't matter. He would be there every time shadowing me. The constant messaging as well drove me to just delete my Snapchat. Thank goodness he never actually managed to get my phone number. At this point, Fishface was incessantly hitting on me, reminding me how much he liked me, despite numerous times of me stating I'm not interested. When I made myself clear, it only seemed to make him push even harder, as if he thought I was trying to play games with him or something. It became more and more common for him to try and touch me or put his arm around me. This is where I drew the line. I told him very clear as day. I'm not interested in you. I don't like men. Don't touch me. He pouted but relented. In touching me, at least. The shadowing got even worse, to the point I couldn't even leave without my now roommate. I couldn't actually get a single dorm for the rest of the actual school year. I became more exhausted paranoid, and began to feel like he was a time bomb waiting to blow. After weeks of this, weeks of sheer anxiety, I spoke to a priest at my university. The father was deeply concerned, and even went so far as to walk me back to my dorm. He made me promise I would speak to security first thing the next day, which I agreed to. Of course, their first question was whether I was really being stalked or if my anxiety made me believe I was being stalked. When I cited all the witnesses to his shadowing me, that was dropped very quickly though. The next question was, was I clear enough with him? I don't really know how much clearer I could have been really. After much back and forth like this, I finally managed to get a no contact order with Fishface. I knew that a no contact order only really meant he couldn't contact me and vice versa, rather than actually physically keeping him away from me. I was okay with this for now. I didn't want to seriously jeopardize the guy's entire future or anything. I just wanted him to leave me alone. For the remainder of the year, there were no more attempts to contact me or be near me. I thought that would be the end of it. But then came sophomore year. 
I could never be exactly sure if it was all a coincidence or if he was really tailing me, but he would start appearing outside of every classroom door, every coffee place, every store, absolutely everywhere. I was in a rough place this year too, totally unrelated to these events, but it certainly didn't help me feel any better. Due to the sheer emotional exhaustion I was battling, I really couldn't give a damn. Okay, follow me, whatever you want. I promise I'm really not that interesting. But this is when I learned of other victims. Their stories were identical to mine. Six of them, mine being the seventh. They'd run into Fishface, a totally innocent encounter, and he just started in on them, bombarding them with messages, following them everywhere, groping them and trying to get them alone. I was horrified to find that every one of these other girls had already reported him to university security. Every one of them had also been prescribed a no-contact order. Seven victims later and this bastard was still on campus, as if he'd never done anything wrong. I learned that this was not uncommon for our university, on top of all the victim blaming. The more I learned, the more deeply my fear ran. It was open season here, and these bastards had full protection. We couldn't do a single thing to get guys like Fishface off our campus, so I resigned myself to being followed by this fucker everywhere. Junior year came around, and it seemed that finally Fishface had given up. I could not be more wrong, though. It was pointed out to me by friends who knew about the stalking that he was in the background of my every move. Throughout the year, he would get closer and closer, until it eventually became worse than I'd ever dealt with before. I was a member of Campus Conservationists, and we were selling reusable grocery bags in lieu of our state banning plastic. After about 45 minutes of peace, I glanced to my right, only to see him there, hiding just around the corner out of sight, staring directly at me. Ice-cold fear ran down my spine, and my stomach dropped. I tore my gaze away and tried to hide my panic. He had never been this close to me since freshman year. There was no mistaking it. He was here for me, and me alone. I texted my girlfriend and let her know what was happening. I'll be honest when I say the rest is kind of a blur. I was too panicked to even remember how we got back to my dorm safely. I thank God every day for my ultra-protective girlfriend. Just two days after that, he appeared in the hallway outside of my class. It was just reaching the end, and I was ready to call it a day. I glanced at my watch. 2.45 p.m. I wandered into the bathroom, ignoring Fishface lurking around the corner. I did my business and approached the door. It began to open, so I called out. Oh, I got it. I opened it for the next person to come in. Fish face. I felt my face go pale and my breath hitch. He stared directly at me with those creepy-ass blue eyes. His giant floppy lips pulled into a small smirk before he turned and disappeared down the hall. My heart thumped in my chest as I re-entered the classroom. I felt myself shaking and tried to hide it. All that kept running through my head was, what was he doing? Why was he trying to get into the woman's bathroom? I glanced down at my watch again and knew I didn't have time to wait for my girlfriend, as the class was minutes from ending. I asked the girl next to me to walk with me to my next class instead. She agreed without hesitation. She was actually a very nice girl, and I thank God for that. I finished my final class for the day and sped back to my dorm. Needless to say, I did not get much sleep that night. I reported everything to security the following morning. I was met with the same pressing questions and doubts. I threw everything I had at them and asked them to watch the security cameras outside my classroom to see him attempt to corner me in the bathroom. I had to even threaten them to contact state police before they finally relented and promised to investigate my claims. They informed me, though, that no action would be taken. They said they could find no evidence of the incidences. When questioned, Fishface said that him appearing around my classrooms and frequented spots around campus were purely coincidental, and he felt so awkward he was going through this again. I took my second semester of junior year off for unrelated reasons, yet I'm relieved to not be on campus with that creep. He's still there. The other victims have mostly transferred to other universities. Due to the college's general mistreatment and poor administration, 
I start my senior year this August at the same university. I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know if he's going to step up his game. I listen to enough true crime to know what could happen, and it scares me like few things ever have. This story takes place in 1993, in a town north of Chicago called Gray's Lake. The only thing Gray's Lake is really known for is that the hard rock band Chevelle hails from there. It also has tons of new homes and these subdivisions that I like to call Lego houses, because they all look exactly the same and they always seem to spring up overnight. Well, in 1993, Gray's Lake wasn't like that at all. It was just a small retirement community with a small high school as well. There were a few small businesses in a park. For the school, there wasn't even any bus service within the actual town, so if you lived in town, you had to either get a ride from your parents or walk to school. The majority of students decided to walk. Now, I didn't grow up in Gray's Lake, but I did transfer there during my sophomore year of high school. Unlike other schools I had been to, I actually made a lot of friends at Gray's Lake. I joined the drama club and was immediately cast in my first play ever. It was Harvey, and I played Dr. Chum Lee. It was a lot of fun actually, but it mainly gave me time after school to hang out and talk with my new friends. Often we would just sit around talking way past sunset, then we had to walk home in the dark. That didn't matter to me though, I'd never really been scared of the dark. On Friday, October 15th, it got dark very, very early. A female friend and I were the last two people to leave after rehearsal. It was only 9 o'clock at that point. Although I was only 5'7 and a whopping 135 pounds, I've always had a lot of bravado. I offered to walk her home because she didn't feel safe walking home alone. She asked me if I would be scared walking home afterwards by myself. I basically told her not to worry about me. I don't get scared very easily. Well, turns out I had never really actually been to her home before and hadn't been aware that she lived completely on the opposite side of the park. I walked her through the park to her house, said goodbye to her at the end of her driveway, and after she thanked me and walked into her home, I began my own long walk back. It was getting pretty damn cold outside, so I shoved my hands into my pockets as I walked down the street. I found the gateway into the park and entered it onto the paved bike path. I was about one-third of the way onto the path. I was very uncomfortable because I knew I was the only person there right away. It was also very dark. That park had very little lighting. I figured it must have been because most people don't tend to take walks in the park in the pitch black of night. Well, when I got on the path, I began looking around trying to convince myself that I was not scared, just cautious. After I walked for a while, I glanced behind me, only to see a man who looked like he was in his mid-twenties, walking on the path just a bit of a way behind me. I didn't see much about him, but I could tell he was wearing a red polo shirt. I had no reason to think the man was up to anything, but I did feel my heart start to beat just a bit faster. Gray's Lake has never had much of a crime rate, so I figured I was pretty safe. Still, despite my apprehension, I figured it was best to just keep up my pace if possible. If the man was up to no good and I started running faster, he might just immediately take off running after me. Well, as I walked along, I tried not to keep beaking behind me, but anybody who's been in a situation like that knows that you always had to look. After a few minutes, I noticed that although it did not seem like it, the man had sped up just so slightly that he had actually gained on me quite a bit. I didn't get a good look at him when I looked back. I decided I should simply speed up at this point. I walked even faster, and as I glanced back, I noticed he was walking faster now too. My heartbeat began to rise, and I finally started to get scared for the first time. At least, the first time I admitted to myself. A quick peek back every now and then revealed he was gaining on me more and more. I saw the exit to the park getting closer and closer. I went ahead and sped up, basically speed walking at this point. 
I quit looking back, and with my heart racing, I got to the arched gateway that led out of the park. Although I tried not to look behind me, my right eye caught something in my peripheral vision, coming at me from behind at an incredible speed. I felt a jolt of electricity course through my body as I realized the man had given up the ghost and was now running at me. I was not going to be able to get away. With my heart pounding in my ears, I noticed a young boy on his bicycle pass me on my right and just keep riding away like nothing was wrong. This calmed my nerves down a bit. I decided to think through the man following me in the park, the whole reason I was even scared in the first place. Turning around to check though, I saw that he had mysteriously disappeared. I had no idea where he had gone or why he went away. I was just very glad that he did. I probably mistook him for somebody doing something bad. He may have just been messing with me, so after that I just went home. At school on Monday though, I came across my female friend. She told me that after I dropped her off, her mom had wanted to come outside and give me a ride home but I had left too quickly for that. I told her I appreciated it, but it wasn't necessary. She then told me that her mom had been really worried about me because her father was a police officer, and her father had called her and told her there had been a rape and attempted murder at the local shell station. She told me that earlier that night a woman had bought some gas. This was before pay at the pump was common, or as far as I'm aware, even existent. And she paid for a car wash as well. When she was going through the car wash, the clerk manually shut it down, locking her in. He then forced his way into the car wash, brutally stabbed and raped the woman, and locked her in her own trunk, leaving her for dead. He was planning on dumping the body later. He put an out-of-order sign on the car wash, even. Thank God, though, the woman was not actually dead. She was able to kick out the back seat of the car and get out of the car wash and go for help. When the clerk found out she was missing, he fled from the station. He wasn't caught until the next day. I have no idea what happened that night. I'm a guy, and I doubt that a man who had raped a girl would try to rape me too. However, he did try to kill her, and if he was scared he'd be caught, he might have tried to do something to me since I was alone. I don't know. What I do know, though, is that I have since been to two different shell stations, and the exact same polo shirt that man was wearing was identical to the one the employees were wearing too. All I know for the period of time that I was walking through Central Park that night is that a man who tried to kill a woman was on the loose. I should preface this by saying I'm gay, and I've always been very shy. I've always had a problem meeting new people because I can't just walk up to people and introduce myself. Since I can't, I tend to use the internet to meet people instead. About 10 years ago, I was on a website called Gay.com. While I was living in Chicago, I generally would only talk to and meet up with people in my area, because although I had a car, I didn't really want any long-distance relationships. I preferred to have people around that I could go visit on short notice and notice is very important as you will learn later. However, I started talking to this man in Milwaukee, or actually right outside of Milwaukee. He was actually a pretty nice guy. We got along really well and he was very polite to me. After we had talked for about a week or so, he finally asked if we could meet up. He offered to drive down to the city and told me that we could do whatever I wanted. Well, I didn't have to drive and he was being really nice to me, so I agreed. It was a two and a half hour drive altogether, which I did not envy him having to undertake. When he arrived, he was pretty nice as well. We spent some time together, had lunch, went out to see a movie, it was Munich, the Steven Spielberg film, and then we drove back to my place. We didn't go inside, but we sat in the car by my bedroom window and talked for about an hour and a half. Finally, he left and went home. A few days later, he asked me if I'd like to join him up in Milwaukee. I had enjoyed our time together greatly before, and he had made the two and a half hour drive to see me, so I thought it was the least I could do to return the favor. So, much later at night this time, I made the drive up to Milwaukee. The man lived in a house, a two-story house that was actually very nice. 
he had told me previously that he was renovating it at the moment. I parked my car and walked up and knocked on the door. No sooner did he open the door than he shoved a glass of Chardonnay into my hand. He had learned from our previous encounter that I was quite a sucker for white wine. He'd also picked out a horror movie, another thing I'm a sucker for, that we could watch that night. As we were watching the movie, he was very insistent on keeping my glass as full as possible. While this didn't really bother me too much, as I love wine, it does have a tendency to go right through me. No more than 45 minutes into the movie, I had to get up and use the bathroom. He told me to walk up the staircase to the second floor, and the bathroom would be on the second door to the right. Well, I walked up there and did my thing. Coming back down, though, I had to remark on the staircase, which was unusually steep. It was then that he made this comment. Yeah, I guess if I was a serial killer or something, it'd be the perfect place to hang a body from, wouldn't it? I was completely taken aback. That was just a very awkward thing to say to somebody who's been in your house for no more than an hour. However, we were watching a horror movie, so maybe he was just getting a bit too into the mood or something. I sat back down to finish watching the film with him, and I stopped drinking my wine. I decided I would just leave after the movie was over. When it finally ended, I thanked him for a nice night and for the wine. Are you leaving already? He asked. Yeah, I really need to get home. I don't sleep well in other people's beds. He asked me if I was drunk at all. I told him no. I would need to have a lot more wine than that in order to get even a bit tipsy. He insisted that I not go home. Well, I have three extra bedrooms and tons of blankets and pillows. You're welcome to sleep in any of them. I mean, I'm not going to try anything on you. Well, him trying anything on me was the last thing on my mind to begin with. My mind was still back on that serial killer comment. Another thing I should mention about me is I have a problem getting myself out of conversations. I'm really not very good at asserting myself. The more I insisted I needed to go home, the more he insisted I should stay. So finally, after about 10 minutes of this back and forth, I decided I'd try and scare him off. I'm on medications for obsessive compulsive disorder. I take Prozac and a medication called Seroquel which is an atypical antipsychotic. Now, I mean, I'm not psychotic, but it does help me sleep. It also comes in handy for getting myself out of sticky situations, and I hoped exactly to use it that way this time. No, I need to get home because I didn't bring my pills with me, and I need to take them before bed. See, I take antipsychotics. I made sure to pronounce it that way. And believe me, you do not want to see me if I haven't taken my meds. He kind of scrunched up his face as if he didn't believe me and asked me what kind of antipsychotics I took. I told him it was Seroquel and asked him if he'd like me to explain to him how they work. He refused and still tried to get me to sleep over. Eventually, I told him I had to go, though. It did take a while longer, but I did leave in the end. On the way home, I decided that I would not be seeing him again. I got home at about 4 o'clock in the morning. Five hours later, I was awakened to my door buzzer. I was on a first floor apartment, and I had a security camera as well. I looked through it and saw that it was him. He was standing outside my door buzzing to get in. This man, who I had seen only eight hours before, had driven all the way from Milwaukee to Chicago without calling me or giving me any indication he was coming. On a whim, he just drove a full two and a half hours. Well, I was not about to answer that door, so I ignored it. Then I remembered that we had set up beside my bedroom window the previous night that we'd hung out. I slowly crept over to the window and shut the blinds. Then I laid down with my back to the wall so that even if he could see in, he wouldn't see me. Sure enough, after five minutes, he went over to the window and started slamming on it. When he got tired of that, he went back to the front door. He continued to alternate this pattern for about an hour. Now I know what you're thinking. Why didn't I call the police? Well, honestly, I thought he would just lose interest and go away. I really had no reason to think he was going to hurt me, because there was no way he could get into my apartment. But he still definitely tried. After maybe 90 minutes of really trying to get in now, he finally gave up and went home. Three hours later, I got an email from him. He demanded that I pay him back for the gas money he had taken to come see me. He told me he knew I was in there, 
and I had done a really stupid thing. A really thoughtless thing by making him drive all that way for nothing. At that point though, I'd had enough and I had to tell him I didn't make him drive all that way. I didn't even invite him. That's on him how creepy it was that he even showed up. He still demanded I pay for his gas money though. I at that point told him to never contact me again. Because now I had the information and an email. If he ever showed up again, I'd call the police. Well, he did stop contacting me after a while, but I think about it very often. Very often. This man was obviously unbalanced. I mean, the serial killer comment could have been attributed to the movie, but who drives that far to see someone they barely know without even telling them that they're coming? I don't know. I just stopped meeting people on gay.com after that. So I was one of those kids you see walking around zoos or amusement parks wearing a leash. Those were already a thing 20 plus years ago, but much less common, and were initially only tied around the wrist. In my case, it was actually kind of a necessity. I would always just start wandering off from the rest of my family no matter what situation or time. This led to one of my stories that led to me earning my leash. This happened when I was about 6 years old. I went to the zoo with my mom and sisters. Before every family outing, my mom made sure to give me the talk about not walking off again, or I'd face the consequences in the future. My mom was a very strict parent, and always made good on her promises. She had to, being a single mother of three. I didn't try to disobey her per se, but I often just didn't pay much attention to the world and people around me. No different this day. I behaved and followed the group for a while, but then a butterfly garden caught my attention, and immediately off I was. When I finally realized I'd separated myself from my mom and sisters again, I panicked and started walking around the zoo, searching everywhere for them. I was more afraid of what my mom's reaction would be than anything else. After a while, I somehow got it into my head that if I could just walk out, find our car, and wait there, my family would eventually find me no matter what. So that's what I tried to do. But of course, being a child, I got lost within just a couple of minutes, walking around a strange neighborhood looking for either our car or the way back to the zoo. Nothing was familiar at all, and I was crying nonstop. My mom was going to be so furious. But then this man came right up to me, just a normal-looking 40-year-old man asking me if I was lost and why I was crying. I explained that I'd lost my family when we were visiting the zoo, and I was now looking for the way back. I couldn't believe my luck when the man told me he had just come from that very same zoo and saw a family there standing near the entrance waiting for a little girl with blonde hair and a baseball cap. It was still a few blocks away though, so he proposed I walk with him to his car, and he could drive me the rest of the way back. Just the mention of his car finally made me hesitate. I told him I wasn't allowed to get into a car with strangers. I was more worried about how mad my mom would be than anything else. He then said something like, Well, that's true, but you look smart enough to know if you can trust someone. I don't remember the exact words, but it was something like that. Then he added that he'd spoken to my parents earlier when they were looking for me, so he was not a complete stranger. That didn't seem right, though. Just to test him, I asked if he had really talked to my dad, who had died just the year before. When he said that he had in fact done so, I broke down crying uncontrollably. I didn't understand the situation I was in. I was confused about everything, and scared about how angry my mom was going to be after all of this. Finally, though, my crying caught the attention of the security guard of a parking building we happened to be standing next to and he walked over and asked if there was anything he could help with. The guy stepped aside with the security guard and started explaining the situation, but he said he was my father and that we were looking for his wife. The security guard seemed to believe him at first, pointing us in the right direction toward the zoo. The man thanks the security guard and proceeds to take my hand and start walking away. The security guard takes one last look at me and walks over to ask me in a comforting, friendly, adult-to-child kind of way why I was still crying. I told him my dad was dead. 
He looked really confused for a few seconds, then asked if this man was really my father. I tell him again, no, my dad is dead. In a split second, his whole face and posture changed. He turned to look at the guy, who was trying to explain now that he'd never actually said he was my dad per se. The security guard must have just misunderstood him. He was just helping me to find my mom. The security guard placed me behind him and said he appreciated the man's help, but he would be taking me off his hands now. The man immediately fled. I don't really think there was much else the security guard could have done in that situation. I explained the whole thing, and after making a quick phone call, he walked me to the entrance of the zoo, which was just around the corner from the building. From there, we were brought to the security's office, where my mom and sisters were already waiting. I feel extremely lucky for the security guard being in the right place at the right time of day, and very grateful for the extra second of time he took to verify that could have made all the difference. So when I was 13, my parents sent me to an all-girls fitness camp to work on becoming the best version of me. Well, let's be honest here. It was a fat camp, and it was as horrible as you can possibly imagine. Bad food, all-day exercise, god-awful counselors. The camp took place on a college campus, where they had us sleeping in dorms of two girls per room. I had high hopes, though, that it wouldn't be a complete waste of a summer, as my roommate seemed like a great girl. Let's call her Mary. We had similar interests, the same style. It seemed like a perfect match. We would chat late into the night, planning our escape from that horrible camp, bemoaning having to give up our cell phones, though I had secretly managed to sneak mine in, and talking about our families and how much they sucked for sending us here. To be honest, I was surprised she was even at this camp. She was actually pretty fit. Her parents had also signed her up for the whole summer versus mine only sending me for two weeks. Only two days into being at this place, I was pulled aside by another girl, who I had become close friends with. She warned me that Mary had quite a lot of issues, and the reason why she had been sleeping in a single for X amount of time was because nobody else wanted to room with her. Well, I brushed it off, thinking it was just rumors or perhaps other girls being unnecessarily mean. That day, at lunch, Mary seemed rather mad at me, and for the life of me, I just could not figure out why. So, when I got a chance, I asked her what was up. She ranted at me about how everyone was so mean, and was I going to leave too? She went on to explain how this one girl she was rooming with switched rooms because she made friends with this popular girl, and she made up lies to be popular. Silly me, I believed her. We continued hanging out, but only now am I aware enough to realize that she was keeping me from hanging out with anyone else. Near the end of my first week, the camp took us on a long walk over to the local pool. It was a big deal as it was super hot and this was only a once a week activity. Mary and I were super excited to go. When we got there, we quickly claimed some chairs and left our stuff there. As Mary had been at the camp for several months, she didn't have to pass some stupid can you swim test. That I assume is mandatory in most camp settings. We were separated for about 20 minutes. After I passed with flying colors, thank you swim team, I jumped into the pool and started floating around. Then I heard her calling my name and saw her waving me over to the deep end of the pool. I swam over and asked her what was up. She said she wanted to show me something. Next thing I know, her hands are wrapped around my neck and she's shoving me under the water. Now, I'm a good swimmer and I'm very capable of holding my breath for quite a long time. But never in my life had anything like this happened to me. I panicked and opened my mouth to scream. Luckily, before my mind had even processed what was happening, I had kicked up my legs and shoved her back and made a desperate escape. I somehow managed to swim away and pull myself out of the pool. As I caught my breath and began to process what just happened, I looked back at her. She was just staring at me, not having moved at all. I quickly grabbed my stuff and ran into the bathroom and called my mom. I was in tears as I explained what happened. It was very obvious she did not believe me. I stayed in the bathroom until we left to go back to the camp. I didn't leave the counselor's side the entire walk back. 
When we arrived at the camp, I was pulled aside by one of the women in charge. She very rudely demanded I give her my cell phone. I of course denied having one and asked why she thought I did. She told me my parents had called about some assault that had happened to me, and they told them I had called. Quickly, I excused it by saying I borrowed a phone from a lady at the pool. Thankfully, they bought that. They told me that I would be moved to a new room the next day, and that I had to spend the night with Mary one last time. Furiously, I begged them to please just let me sleep on the floor of another girl's room even, but they insisted I was being melodramatic. As soon as I was left alone, again I raced to the closest bathroom and called my mom. That's when I learned the truth about Mary. I wasn't her second roommate, or her third, or her fourth, or her fifth. I was the sixth girl to stay in a room with her. Three of her roommates had left the camp early, and the other two had switched rooms at the first opportunity. All five of the others had made allegations of violence from Mary against them, but the camp refused to do anything, and insisted she was just a troubled girl who wanted to make friends. Or as they told my parents, well, she has had some issues in the past. That night I didn't sleep at all, and neither did Mary. She sat bolt upright in bed, staring at me the entire damn night. I could feel her watching me, and I was terrified. I had my phone clutched in my hand with 911 dialed and ready to call at any moment. I practically cried tears of relief when the sun came up. That day, I was moved to a new room in a different building, and somehow managed to break my foot in the process, so my parents drove up and took me home with a cast on my foot to commemorate my time there. To this day, I've had issues from what this girl did to me and I've never been able to live with roommates or make friends very easily after. So, a few days ago, I got back from a family holiday in the countryside, on a really nice property. I'm not sure if it was through Airbnb or some other similar company, but imagine that kind of thing a fully furnished house with more or less all amenities provided. I have a fairly wide extended family, some of whom would be staying with us, some of whom wouldn't be, and some of whom would only be staying for a few nights before leaving early. My parents and I would be staying all week though, and we were the very first to arrive at the house. As I said before, it was a very good looking property. Not surrounded by other houses, but not completely isolated either. Because we were the first to arrive, we basically got first picks on rooms, and were able to unpack and explore the whole place before everyone else even arrived. I got my own room on the first floor. For reference, I'm 18 years old. There's one room on the top floor with a bathroom attached. Going up there, the first thing that struck me was just how hot it was in there. There were windows through which the sun was shining in, which I thought might be the source of this heat, so I shut all the blinds, but it didn't really get any cooler. Aside from the bathroom, there was another door in this room, but it was locked from the other side. It goes without saying that this was kind of weird, not the least because I had no idea what could possibly be on the other side of that door. There was a locked door downstairs too, but that one had an obvious keyhole and was very clearly a boiler room, due to the sounds I could hear on the other side. But with this room, I just really had no idea what it could possibly be. There was also a small crawlspace door upstairs. It didn't have a lock or handle or anything like that, but I couldn't figure out how to open it. I'm not sure how relevant that crawlspace really was to all of this, but I thought I'd at least mention it as somewhat suspicious. Anyway, after a few hours, other family members arrived, including my grandparents who, being the oldest in the family, and so the most respected, got to choose a room as well and chose upstairs. Despite the fact that my grandparents are both in their 70s, they're both extremely fit, not just for their age, but for anybody really. They keep very active, and they don't get scared very easily at all. I couldn't say I really envied them taking that top room though. I'll skip most of the other details about the holiday since they aren't really relevant to the story itself, and fast forward to the first night. The property had this large garden, like really big. People at one end would have to scream for someone at the other end to even hear them. 
What made the property even nicer to me was there was a large hot tub out back by that garden. On the first evening, 11 p.m., I was in the hot tub by myself. Most of the other people had already gone to sleep. Having all the lights out and just sitting in the bubbling water, the only sounds audible to me were the buzzing of the jets and the chirping of the crickets. It was quite the serene experience. Just barely over the sound of the water, though, I could have sworn I heard something moving down on the other end of the garden. There was no way I could be sure of that, though, since it was so far away. I turned on the lights in the tub to as high as they could go, but obviously that didn't provide me with very much in the way of visibility. Looking back, it was actually probably a pretty stupid move because it made me more visible. I still couldn't see to the end of the garden, but now I kinda had the creeps. I realized just how exposed I felt, and decided to wrap up and head to bed. My room had these big glass doors that faced out into the back garden, which also made me kind of uneasy. I'd be lying though if I told you I heard any scratches on my window or something cliche like that. I actually didn't hear anything else and went to sleep perfectly fine. The next morning at breakfast though I was talking with my grandma, who sorta of dropped a bombshell on me. She told me that last night she had noticed a light turn on then off in the locked room upstairs. Not that I said anything but this really freaked me out. I know the idea of someone secretly living in the house with us sounds dumb. And that's not really where my mind was going. Truth be told, I wasn't sure what to think. So that night I got totally drunk, like really hammered. I'm a bit of a lightweight and obviously not an experienced drinker, so it really didn't take much for me to get to that point. Regardless, I'm not exactly proud of the state I was in. I went out to the hot tub again, this time with my cousin who was a bit older than me, not even aware of my surroundings. The heat of the water combined with the effects of the alcohol made my brain basically turn into mush. I couldn't think clearly, and that's by my own admission. We were just listening to music and sort of chilling, when she suddenly pointed over at the other end of the garden to get my attention. Hey, do you see that? She asked. The garden had these automatic lights along one side, so if there was any movement they would turn on, illuminating one half of the lawn. From what I had seen two of them, they weren't super sensitive, so you would have to get really close. I peered over the side of the tub but couldn't see anything in the dark. That's when my cousin had the bright idea to reach over the side and throw a football onto the garden. The sound it made as it thudded onto the grass still makes me feel sick. The lights flashed on, revealing a dark figure scurrying behind the fence at the back of the yard and just out of sight. We should have probably gotten out of the tub and went to bed at that point, or in reality called the cops, but for some dumb reason, we decided to go and investigate ourselves. She was a few drinks in too, I'll note. Not as much as me, and she keeps it down much better, but we both had some liquid courage going if you know what I mean. Once we got there, it was too dark to see much, but the fence was very clearly broken, to the point where someone could easily squeeze through the gap in it and make their way onto the road adjacent to the property. That alone is creepy enough, but what really freaks me out is what happened the next day. For a little bit of context, I'm in the build-up to some really important exams right now, and just because I was on holiday didn't mean I would be cutting myself any slack and studying. Because of this, when my whole family went out that day, I stayed home to work. In my room, there was this rubber door stopper thing propping my door open, and a spare one in the drawers as well. I left the one propping the door open next to it, in case I wanted to keep the door open or more realistically keep it shut. Bear in mind that particular door did not have a lock on it. I kept the second one hidden under my bed in a really specific place you would never find unless you were deliberately looking for it, tucked away in the bed frame basically. The door doesn't close by itself, but if there's a draft it will eventually slam shut after some time. At some point I got very bored of studying and decided to go make myself a drink and get some snacks. What can you do? While in the kitchen though, I heard this loud thud come from my room. Because of the way the kitchen was positioned, I couldn't actually see my door though. At first this understandably freaked me out, but then I heard the front door open. It was just my family. I put it out of my mind and returned to my room, only to see that the rubber door stopper was balanced on the door frame, just flush against the wall. 
I assumed it must have been someone in my family. I walked back in, only to see that the other stopper was still next to the door. I questioned my family at dinner. They all swore up and down they hadn't moved a single thing. This created some quite nasty implications, mainly that I had been home alone with someone, or perhaps something. I'm not sure which is scarier, really. Luckily, nothing else of this nature happened during my trip, and needless to say, I was grateful just to get home. This remains the creepiest thing that's ever happened to me. I haven't told my cousin about the incident, since I figure I'd probably just sound crazy. I can only speculate, too, as to whether or not this was related to the incident from the night before. I'd like to think they're not, but I'm fairly certain about what I saw. My only advice to anyone using Airbnb or similar services is to thoroughly research the area you'll be staying in and make absolutely sure the property is secure. This is a real story, but some of you might probably not believe me. I usually don't even talk about this because of the trauma and the fact that people look at me like I'm crazy when I tell them about it. This was on the news too, but out of privacy and respect, I won't share the articles or the news clips here. Anyways, this story is about my intuition and my friend's at times strange older brother. I'll call him Corey and I'll call her Kara. I always used to play over at her house all the time, considering her mom and my mom were the best of friends. Back then, the whole neighborhood was basically a playground, and it honestly felt so much bigger as a child. The world can be a scary place, but I always had common sense, and that kept me in one piece, considering I was very accident-prone. Anyways, I'd play a lot at Kara's house, but I always had the weirdest feeling around her brother Corey. It felt like he was constantly watching me, and it made me very uncomfortable. He seemed to be popular, and everyone always hung out around him, but every time I was around him, I just felt very sick. He would do these things like kick small animals and make them yelp. He was very aggressive when he played with us too. One time he held my head underwater when we went swimming, and another time he watched me change in the bathroom. I noticed him after I got dressed, and saw the door cracked open. I didn't see him, but I felt his presence there. Sometimes it even felt like his own mom was scared of him. One day, I went over to Carr's house when I was in middle school. The door was unlocked, so I just walked right in. I thought they were home because I smelled spaghetti cooking, and I loved Kara's mom's cooking. I turned around. There was Corey acting just like normal. Nothing rang a bell at first. I asked him where Kara and her mom were. He said they had just gone to the store. He said I could go into Kara's room and wait for her to get back. I almost did but I felt him looming behind me as I was about to go into her room. This was normal, just like every other time, but for some reason I got terrified out of nowhere. It felt like I was suffocating, and my throat started to hurt, and tears started to form in my eyes. I turned around and looked at him, and all of a sudden I just started begging him to let me go with tears pouring from my eyes. We stood there for five minutes in suffocating silence, and then he just said I could go. I faced him as I slowly backed up toward the door and ran all the way back home. I called the police, but by the time they arrived, he had already killed himself. Kara was found dead in her bed, and her mom was found dead in hers as well. He had stabbed them both to death. To this day, I still don't know why he let me go and didn't kill me too. So growing up, I loved to explore abandoned places, which led to me driving a lot at night because I loved the thrill of it. Those stories are for another day, though. This story is one of those night drives. This happened about 15 years ago, so some of the details might be a little hazy or different than what actually happened, but I'll try my best to recall it as accurately as I can. My friends and I decided we would take a weekend trip to the ocean, we were all prepared for the trip and ready to leave when I suddenly got a call from work. Trying to be a responsible young adult, after much frustration and moaning, I obliged to go into work. 
I told my friends to just leave without me. I would leave after work and meet up with them there that night. When work finally ended, the sun was already starting to set. I knew it would be a night drive, as the ocean was a three-hour drive away. I hopped into my car and began the drive to meet up with my friends. As I didn't have a GPS in my 06 Honda, I looked up the fastest route there before I began my journey. I found out that if I took this two-road highway, it would cut 30 minutes off of my trip, so I made the decision to take this route. An hour into my drive, there were more and more trees, and less and less cars. At this point, it was very dark, and any light poles were far and few between. The headlights were my only source of light at this point. My eyes had just begun to adjust to the darkness when I saw a figure off to the side of the road with their thumb out. Me, thinking that people aren't always bad and always willing to help, decided to slow down to see if there was anything I could do. I was always taught as a child to help whoever I can, so it wasn't anything that I thought long and hard about. As my car came to a complete stop, I could tell the person was a middle-aged woman. I cracked my passenger side window and asked if she needed any help. She came closer to the car and looked me up and down. Then she said, Hey, would you give me a ride over to the next town? At this point, there were no red flags yet. I didn't really think her request was that weird, so I agreed to give her a ride. I was an average-sized 18-year-old, and she was very small in stature, so I knew if anything happened, I could take her. I unlocked the door for her and she hopped right in. As soon as she sat down, she began to profusely thank me. Looking into her eyes, I could see she had clearly been crying. She introduced herself as Molly and said, Just to the next town, please. Then she started staring out the window. I started driving and began to ask her some questions, just so the car ride wouldn't be awkward silence, you know. I already knew the next town was near the ocean anyway, which was my destination. It would be another hour or so before we would reach it, so it would be really weird to just sit there in silence. When I asked her what she was doing here in the middle of nowhere on a highway, she said her and her boyfriend had gotten into a big fight on their way to the ocean, and he had kicked her out of the car. Somehow, in my young mind, I still didn't see the danger in this. I began to console her and tell her how sorry I was, when she quickly turned to me and yelled, Hey, slow down! My instincts kicked in and I slammed on the brakes, thinking maybe there was something in the middle of the road I hadn't seen. What? What's wrong? Molly says, Oh, I thought you missed the turn. Now, this small highway had cross streets about every half mile. I thought you said you were going to the next town, you know, to the ocean. She gave me the creepiest smile and said, Oh, no, I live out here. I don't really feel like going to the ocean anymore. Red flags started to go off in my head. I gave her a weird look. Are you telling me you live out in the middle of those woods? Sweat started to run down the side of her face. Yeah, sorry. We continued on our drive. Only now, I was a little bit nervous about this stranger I had randomly picked up. She turned to look out the window again, and this time, she wouldn't say a single word to me. Clearly, something was very off. I kept her in my peripherals. Finally, after what seemed to be an hour, but was only actually a couple of minutes, she says, Slow down. The turn is coming up. But this time, she didn't even turn to look at me as she said it. As the car began to slow down at the crossroad, I saw two shadows duck quickly behind a tree. Being somewhat afraid now of what might happen if I took that turn, instead I slammed on the gas and drove right past. Molly began to scream at me to stop and go back. At this point, my adrenaline was quite high. I knew had I turned where she asked me to, something horrible was going to happen to me. About 10 minutes down the road, I finally stopped the car and yelled at Molly. Get the fuck out of my car! I grabbed the BB gun I had on the side of my door and pointed it at her. Get the fuck out of my car or I will shoot you! She frantically opened the door and fell out. She started running back the way we came. I sat there with my passenger side door open, still pointing the gun at nothing but trees, as I watched her disappear into the darkness. After a few moments, when I'd finally calmed down, 
I reached over to my passenger seat to close the passenger door, only to see a knife on the pavement where she'd fallen out of the car. I quickly closed that door and sped to the ocean where my friends were waiting. That was the very last time I ever picked up a hitchhiker. A few years ago, I worked as a janitor for a cleaning company. We cleaned all sorts of places. Churches, schools, doctor's offices, you name it. The job was mostly night shift and sometimes took us to some of the more sketchy areas that were around. We had one job we went to twice a week. It was this small dentist's office, located in an office park surrounded completely by woods. On the section of road where the main, more urban road started to change into a desolate country one. When I say this office was small, I mean it was really, really small. This is an important detail to remember for the story later, as it is relevant. The office consisted of a tiny lobby when you first walked in. Then behind a window in the lobby was a little reception area, where there were various file cabinets and two workstations. Beyond that, straight through there was a narrow hallway with little rooms where the dentists would do their various cleanings and procedures on patients. At the far end of the hall, there was a door that led to a basement, and a slightly larger room on the right that contained two or three dentist chairs. The kind where you sit on it and recline so the dentist can see into your mouth. That was the layout of the entire office. Like I said, the place wasn't very big. The first incident was when I was with my work partner, Matt. I was the one the boss had left in charge, and therefore it was my responsibility to walk the halls and inspect everything before we left the job site to make sure everything was done properly. It was also my responsibility to set the security codes to each building before we went out, so while I did this, I sent Matt outside to the dumpster with a bag of garbage, which we had accumulated from the office. The dumpster was on the far end of the parking lot up against the woods. While I was inspecting the rooms to make sure nothing had been missed by either of us, I spotted some dirt on the floor, so I plugged the vacuum back in and began to suck up the dirt. Since we were packing up the work truck with all our supplies and it was a warmer night out, I left the office door open while Matt was going to the dumpster. This would make it easier to take our supplies out from the office. As I was vacuuming, I realized Matt was taking an exceptionally long time to come back from the dumpster. He wasn't normally the type to mess around and cause delay either. I turned the vacuum off and poked my head out the front door, only to see Matt sprinting away from the direction of the dumpster his face contorted with fear. Hey man, what the hell's wrong? He started pointing and turned, panicking and gasping for breath as he tried to explain what he'd just seen. Didn't you just hear me scream? I told him no, as I'd been vacuuming and had just turned it off to see where he'd been. He told me that when he went to put the garbage in the dumpster, some guy was crouched in the dark muttering gibberish to himself. When Matt saw him, the guy got up and screamed and started sprinting at him. He told me he drew his pocket knife to try and scare the guy off, and possibly defend himself if needed. Fortunately, it worked. The guy turned around and sprinted off into the woods, but he wasn't sure if he was still in the area. He wanted to leave for the next job site immediately. I will say that what I did next was neither smart nor very nice to Matt. See, I was quite troubled at this point in my life, to the point where I didn't really care what happened to me. I was also a bit cocky as I had done martial arts for four years and took it quite seriously, often boxing against people way bigger and stronger than me, so in my own mind I was pretty tough. I was also a bit of a kiss ass towards my job as I liked it perhaps a bit too much back then. I noticed Matt hadn't actually put the garbage in the dumpster and I told him we'd have to go back to put it in since we couldn't very well just leave it in the parking lot. He asked me if we couldn't just put it in the back of my car and drive it to the next job and dispose of it there. I told him no as I didn't want it stinking up my car. And besides, where's the fun in that? Yeah, I was kind of a bit of a prick and a bit crazy. The look on Matt's face suggested he thought the very same thing. I laughed it off and told him I'd go with him, but first I had to get something out of my car. I went and grabbed this big heavy metal flashlight I had. 
It was super bright, so not only could it be used to see, but it could also be used to blind someone, and perhaps as a weapon if need be. I locked the door to the car and took the lead with my flashlight, while Matt carried the garbage bag on his pocket knife. I shined my light first at the trees near the dumpster. I didn't see anything, so I shined it at the dumpster itself. Still nothing, so I called out. Hey, who's back there? Come out right now, you piece of shit. Trying to sound tough. Truthfully, I was just looking to be a bit of a fake badass. I knew that whoever that person had been, they had probably run far off into the woods, never to be seen by either of us again. When we got to the dumpster, I walked around a ten foot distance from its right side and shined my flashlight behind it. There was no crazy man there. I told Matt, who was hanging about twenty feet back now, that it was safe for him to put the garbage in. He did, and then we went back to the car and moved on to the next job. The second incident occurred at the same place about a year later. I was working with this new guy named Andrew, and we were cleaning up just like at that time with Matt. We had all our supplies at the front of the building by the door, and I was getting ready to set the codes for the night. We had been through the whole building, both of us, and seen every room, desk, and chair. We were the only ones in there, for sure. That's when I heard a faint whispering begin coming from the other end of the hall that I mentioned earlier. The one by the basement door which we weren't allowed to go down? We never even checked down there since it wasn't part of our job. We didn't even know what was down there, but we had been in this office together for at least an hour, and we hadn't heard or seen anyone. It was well after closing time. The whispering sounded like two women. At first, I thought I was just hearing things, but when I looked over at Andrew, he looked back at me with his eyes wide open. He said to me quietly, what the fuck is that? I asked him if he was hearing what I was hearing, just to confirm. He said yes. We both stood, staring down that hall. The whispering stopped for a second, then started up again and started to get closer. We both turned to look at each other. Fuck that, man. We're not getting paid enough for this. Let's go. I set the alarm codes and we walked out and locked the door. I was now a bit smarter and less macho than the last time. To this day, I still don't know what all of that was about. Sometimes I guess buildings make noises, the wind settling or whatever, but to have two people hear the same thing at the same time, combined with that crazy guy incident from a year prior, just seems weird. I know that some of these medical type buildings have different drugs stored in them, and sometimes people did break into them to steal the drugs, so maybe it was that, but I don't really know. Anyways, I don't work there anymore and I haven't for a long time, which I'm glad about that. I want to preface this story by stating that I've had my fair share of encounters with creepy men. This situation, however, scared the life out of me. It was the first time I genuinely felt like my life was in danger. My husband and I had to drive 17 hours last week to North Carolina for a wedding. It was honestly an exhausting week, and we basically spent the entire time rushing from one family gathering to another. We were staying in a motel for the time we were there. We had already been at this motel for a few days by the time the day of the actual wedding rolled around. And the day of the wedding? It was quite hectic. We were rushing around everywhere, trying to get ready to leave for the venue. My husband got ready before me, so he could do some last-minute things before we had to leave. That left me all alone in our motel room, to get ready before he returned. It was extremely, brutally hot outside, so I decided to do my hair and makeup in just my underwear, so I wouldn't be sweating in my nice dress the entire time. The way this motel was laid out... The sink and mirror were in the general open area of the room, with the toilet and shower in another room. So anyone walking by our room window could see me standing at the mirror. I did, however, have the curtains completely drawn closed. These curtains were a bit sheer, though, so you could technically see the shadow of someone walking by on the outside, or maybe they could see the silhouette of me inside the room. I was curling my hair in the mirror, when I noticed the silhouette of a man walking by my room window. As he's passing by my window, I see him stop and start trying to look inside. 
At first, I thought it was my husband, trying to see if I was ready, so I paid no mind to it. But the longer the guy stood there, bobbing his head around trying to get a better look through the curtains, I began to realize it was not my husband. Obviously, why wouldn't he just come in if it was? Now, I was starting to get a little bit freaked out. Before I could even do anything, though, I watched as this guy started to go for my room door. My utter shock and horror came when he was actually able to open it and walked inside. Before my husband had left, he had forgotten to pull the door shut all the way until it clicked into the lock. He was very upset at himself when I told him this later. So now here I was, face to face with this man, in my underwear no less. He was at least six feet tall, just standing in my room staring at me. I thought to myself, this is it, he's going to attack you. That's a very scary realization to have. I also thought to myself, you're going to have to burn his eye sockets out with this curling iron if you want to survive. For a few seconds, probably only a second or two, but it felt much longer. He just stood there staring at me, like I was a piece of meat and he was starving, ready to pounce at me like prey. He then began to smile the most evil-looking toothy grin I've ever seen, and started mumbling something under his breath. I couldn't quite make out what he was saying completely, but I did make out the words pretty lady and come here. I don't know if it was the fight or flight response, but I just suddenly got extremely pissed. I charged towards him, ready to strike him with my hot curling iron. I screamed as loud as I could. Get the fuck out of here! It must have startled him quite a bit, because he jumped back and out onto the balcony of the motel. I saw this as my chance, and I ran for the door. Luckily, I was able to get to the door and slam it shut right before he was about to make his second attempt at entering inside. I immediately collapsed onto the floor, sobbing. I was literally too scared to move from that spot, until my husband came back 15 minutes later. I told him the whole thing, and he was very freaked out. He initially wanted to find the guy so he could beat the shit out of him, but I refused to let him leave my side. He must have apologized a thousand times during the rest of our trip for not making sure the door was locked before leaving, but I told him that day was so rushed, and that whole trip really, that I could understand how it happened. We went to the motel management and told them the whole story. The police were obviously called and I gave them a description of the guy so they could see if it was someone who was staying in the motel. After going around to the few motel occupants, they said no one matched his description and concluded he was not staying there at the time. Obviously, we were late to the wedding that day, and the whole experience just kind of ruined what should have been a happy time. We planned on staying another day before our long drive home, but we honestly just both wanted to get out of there as soon as possible. We skipped most of the reception, went back to the motel, and packed up and left. I'm usually always so vigilant when locking my doors, especially when I'm home alone. Just goes to show you that all it takes is that one time you forget to check your locks for a certain unwanted guest to invite themselves inside. I'm really writing this out as a way to vent because I'm in a situation where I kind of feel really stuck. Any advice is appreciated, but I'm not sure there's anything that can be said that will actually help. I've tried just about everything, so I'm going to start from the beginning. This is a story two years in the making, so I'll try to be as thorough as possible. In 2019, I graduated with my master's degree and moved to a relatively rural area for my PhD. Thinking we'd make an investment, my dad and I purchased a house. The intent was to rent it out once I completed my PhD. This house was only a block away from a dive bar where my dad was able to make some pretty good friends. He introduced me to everyone, and everyone let me know that I would be so happy in my new house because my next door neighbor was the absolute nicest guy you could ever meet. So we met the neighbor, and he did seem nice enough. He suggested we exchange numbers just in case I ever needed anything, and I thought that was a pretty good idea. I mean, what's the worst that could happen? 
A few days later, my dad left to go back to his home in another state, and I was left to my own devices. Literally the exact day he left, it started. My neighbor texted me while I was away and let me know he'd left a gift for me on my front porch. In this text exchange, he started using pet names like Sweetie and Cutie. I went home and he had left a hand-painted feeding dish for my cats in my mailbox. At this point though, I wasn't that alarmed. He was just being extra nice, I thought. The next day, he sent me more texts with pet names and I took the opportunity to make sure he knew I was not interested in anything romantic. He replied back with some rambling text about how all a person ever needs is friends and he would just like to be friends with me. After that, he would send me texts very frequently. Everything from inviting me fishing to telling me he left more gifts on my porch. I would often not reply or just tell him I was busy. I didn't mean to be rude, but I also had no interest in any sort of relationship with him other than neighborly. One night, I got a text from the manager of the bar down the street, letting me know that if my neighbor ever knocked on my door, I should not answer. She then told me that my neighbor had walked down to the bar with a hatchet and told the bartender he was hearing voices that got louder as he got closer to the bar. He'd threatened to kill someone with the hatchet if the voices didn't stop. They'd called the police and the police took the hatchet from him, but they made no arrest. The manager of the bar picked me up and I spent the night at her house. She told me that the police said my neighbor was on meth. After that, I tried to keep my distance even more, but things got even weirder. One day, I went out to my car to find a dead squirrel in my driveway. This squirrel had very clearly been run over and moved right in front of my driver's side door. I stepped over it, got in my car, and left. When I returned home, the squirrel was gone. Shortly thereafter, I received a text from my neighbor that said, Someone or something put a dead squirrel in your driveway, you know. Don't worry, I moved it away for you. I felt this was a weird way to word this and I suspect he's the one that placed it there in the first place. Another time, I walked out of my house to see he had placed an unspent shotgun shell on the bricks in front of his yard. He came out and told me it was to serve as a warning for anyone walking between our houses. For the next couple of months, I did my very best to avoid him. He would text me inviting me over, and I would come up with an excuse or just ignore him completely. I still wanted to remain cordial since he was my neighbor, but it was getting very annoying and I was starting to get uncomfortable. He would text me as soon as I got home, telling me he was watching me come and go from my house. Around Halloween, he handcrafted a large basket and wrote, Here lies the last son of a bitch who played mind games. November 2012. What the fuck? All this time still sending me these texts. Eventually, I got fed up and stopped responding completely. Less than two weeks after I did so, he threw a 50-pound flower pot at my front door. You know those big concrete planters? Yeah, one of those. I called the police who advised me to get a stalking no-contact order. A few days later, I was watching TV when a notification popped up that my neighbor was trying to cast a video to my screen. I declined it twice and filed another report with the police. During this time, I did start the process of getting a stalking no-contact order. I saw three different victim advocates, who all told me different things. I went out of town for a conference, and during that time, someone attempted to break into my home. I had an ADT security system, so while they had not succeeded, I was made aware of the attempt. After the conference, I came home to the entire world shutting down because of COVID. I was trapped in my home 24-7 with my stalker neighbor next door. Luckily, court proceedings for protection orders didn't stop, though. Right before court, he sent me a text telling me he was sorry for what he'd done. That he could tell when he'd seen me outside that he made me uncomfortable. Then he went on to tell me he could tell my hair has gotten longer and I looked more beautiful than ever. I went to court and provided all of the evidence I had the timeline of everything that had ever happened, the text he'd sent me asking if I wanted a massage, the text I sent him telling him the way he was speaking to me was inappropriate, the text saying he knew that he made me uncomfortable. I also told the judge I suspected he was the one who attempted to break into my house while I was out of town. 
The kicker is, he didn't deny any of it. Actually, he told the judge he took full accountability for everything. He said he was in recovery and was trying to turn over a new leaf. He didn't oppose the protection order at all. So in March 2020, I actually received the stalking no contact order. Everything was pretty quiet for a while. I mean, he did some weird shit every now and then, but that's just because he was a weird guy. It wasn't anything that made me fear for my safety though. That is, until he got on drugs again. At this time, we found an unspent shotgun casing in my flower bed. It was consistent with the one he had previously used to send a warning. This occurred a couple months after I started dating my boyfriend, and I suspect it was a warning to him. After this, and for a variety of reasons, my boyfriend moved in with me. He moved in pretty quickly, but everything turned out fine. We're still together and as happy in our relationship as we can be. New Year's 2021. I was awoken suddenly by yelling. I turned on my security cameras and got footage of him sticking his head out his window, screaming obscenities at my bedroom window for seven minutes. It doesn't sound like a long time, but when your stalker is screaming threats and obscenities, seven minutes is quite a while. He even called me a harlot. He said happy fucking new year, and he said he was going to blow up his house with his gas line. I called the police who responded very quickly. They told me he never said my name, so they couldn't prove it was a violation of the protection order. The officer said, and I quote, There's nothing illegal about yelling in your own house. They left without even speaking to him. All I could do at this point was do my best to avoid him. I parked on the street because my driveway was pretty close to his front porch. I got used to living with my curtains drawn. I always made sure my cameras were charged. All five of them. Yes, because of him, I spent over $1,000 on cameras. Every inch of my yard was covered. Since then, he's been seen by me and other neighbors, talking to people who aren't there, going outside and screaming nonsense. Things like, I have Cheerios on my necklace, or I'll shove my penis in your butt. I'm not even joking. This basically brings me to last week. In the morning, I was getting ready for the day, when I heard a bunch of screaming. Someone is gonna die over this sweatshirt. I turned on the cameras. I got footage of him walking around the alley behind my house, screaming. Are you fucking proud? How about I get my shotgun, and I'll get everybody all fired up? I called the police. Once again, they didn't charge him with violation of the protection order. Instead, they gave him an ordinance violation for disturbing the peace. The police just told me it seemed like he was off his medication again, and that was that. They left. Last night, I was awoken to hammering outside my window at 1 a.m. He was cutting down his privacy fence horizontally. I called the police for a noise complaint, and they just told him to stop. As I write this, he's outside continuing to horizontally cut down his privacy fence. That means the privacy fence only stands about three feet tall now. This was the one thing that made me feel relatively safe about hanging out in my backyard, and now that's gone. All of this is to say I'm fucking tired. I just want to live in a house where I can be sure that my neighbor won't try to murder me, where I can feel confident he's not going to try to break in. My boyfriend and I are trying to buy a house to move, but it's very difficult. I'm a PhD student, so I don't make very much money. Renting won't work because I have four cats plus my partner's cat and dog, although we have secured a place for those if necessary. And finding a place to rent with so many animals is difficult, if not impossible. I refuse to rehome them, so maybe it's partially my fault I'm stuck in this situation. My dad has agreed to co-sign on another mortgage, and I've gotten a second job. We should be able to save up enough money within a few months. But until then, I'm kinda stuck. I just don't know what else to do. I'm so tired and angry, so I figured I'd write this to vent. If you made it this far, thanks for reading at all. There's still so many different instances I've left out. But I'm just so exhausted that I can't tell them all. This happened in May of 2015 in California, which will help those of you who are familiar. I had graduated college in June of 2014, 
moved back into my old hometown, and started a consulting company with my boyfriend, which was going very well. We had just finished a contract in the Bay Area, and were beginning a new one about eight hours south in Torrance. He moved down there first to start setting up, while I took care of loose ends at our closing contract before moving down to meet him. The day comes and I pack my car and head south down the I-5. For the uninitiated, it's a straight highway with little in the way of scenery, aside from the occasional strip mall. Its monotony has a reputation for putting drivers to sleep at the wheel. I pass a strip mall with gas and a fast food joint and decide to fill up my car and my stomach. I go to park in the food venue's parking lot, but it's completely full, so I park across the street at a hotel, which at the time I didn't think anything of. I go inside and eat my meal, then cross the street to get back to my car. I'm well into the hotel parking lot when a pickup truck pulls down the aisle, cuts off my path, and stops, with the passenger side facing me. The driver was alone, a clean-cut white male in his mid-thirties. I don't really remember anything about him except that he looked very generic and buttoned up. The way he pulled in front of me to block my path didn't initially set off alarm bells, as he had done it in a pretty organic way. He rolled his windows down, and this dialogue followed. Excuse me, miss, but could you please tell me where the grocery store in town is? Oh, I'm sorry, I'm not from here, so I couldn't say. Oh? Where are you from? Uh, good question. I don't know, not here though. I didn't say that to be rude. I just moved through so many cities at that point and was on my way to a new one, so I wasn't sure really how to answer that question. He laughed and made a joke, then asked me where I was headed. I mentioned that I was in the process of moving. I will say that he was very charismatic and at this point I just thought he was trying to flirt with me. If I hadn't been so exhausted or in a relationship on another day, it just might have worked. He makes another comment about how unpleasant moving can be and then gives a warm chuckle and extends his hand to shake mine. Well, I'm glad I got to meet you. I'm Scott, by the way. If you recall, the truck was in front of me with the passenger side facing me. I actually took a step forward to grab his hand, then got the delayed response of every alarm bell that should have gone off earlier. 1. I'm in a hotel parking lot. 2. He just asked me a question that established I don't know where I am. 3. Another question that established I'm alone. And 4. Another that established I'm not expected at my destination for many more hours. The thing that connected all these synapses? When he extended his hand to me, he didn't make even the faintest effort to make it accessible at all. He didn't lean over the seat or move toward me in any way. Instead, his hand was hovering comfortably over the center console, waiting for me to grasp it, which in order to do so, I would have had to lean well into the car. Again, I had already taken a step forward towards him and begun to raise my hand to take his, when these sirens went off. I rocked backward to where I was standing. I remember looking into his eyes for what felt like forever, feeling everything click into place while also half convinced my imagination was just running wild. His hand was still waiting steadily. I lowered mine and felt my eyes narrow slightly with suspicion. I'm going to walk away from your car now, Scott. Boom. The truck burns rubber, thick gray smoke shooting out as the guy guns it out of the hotel lot at 100 miles per hour. He must have slammed it. Regrettably smart on his end because I didn't have the license number or anything to offer to the police later. In the immediate minutes following the event, I felt very relieved, but I hadn't really processed the full weight of what just happened. Unfortunately for me, I had many more hours to think back and analyze the whole interaction to shreds. The car was somewhat lifted. There could have easily been another person, or even two or three other people hiding inside. Would he have pulled me in? Would he have injected me with something? My mind just kept creating on these scenarios where I wake up hours later and nobody would even know where in my drive I went missing or possibly even notice for most of the day. I still get creeped out thinking about how close I came to taking his hand and how fortunate I was that I didn't allow my reaction to be driven by manners as criminals often take advantage of.
To give you some context, I'm 20 years old. I live in the suburbs in a small residence of six houses. My gate is very, very often broken, including today, which means that 80% of the time it's wide open. Anyone can get into the small courtyard. My house has one floor and there are four bedrooms including mine. Downstairs, there's a guest bedroom, which is used as a treatment room because I have big health problems. This is where all the equipment, medicines, like morphine and doses that could kill an average person, and where the care takes place as well. I have a dog and I'm very, very close to him. He's pretty much my life. He feels everything to the point of feeling my epileptic seizures before they happen sometimes, even recognizing the nurses who are arriving. He recognizes them by the sound of their tires as they arrive in the yard. He never barks, except when there is a problem. Finally, to let you know, a nurse spends four to five times a day to give me care at home, including infusions. This is quite important to the story. That morning, like every morning, my nurse arrived at 8 a.m. For the rest of the story, I'll call her Sandra. She took care of me as usual, that is to say an infusion of painkillers, replacing the antibiotic diffusers, giving me a blood test, and remaking the cassette of my morphine pump. We usually chat about everything and nothing all at once. She tells me stories of different patients during my treatments. These nurses are an integral part of my life. They've looked over me for over six years now. She leaves after 40 minutes and says, See you later. I'm sure I'll be a little bit late, but don't worry. That day, I had a medical appointment in the morning, and I was alone all day because my parents were working, except, of course, the nurses passing by every four hours or so. Once back from my meeting, I sat on my sofa with my dog waiting for my nurse to arrive. After a while, I heard the tire noises pulling up. I got up because I thought it must be my nurse, but the dog started to growl behind the door. I took a look at the time, 11.50 a.m. I told myself it was a little bit early, but sometimes instead of coming after, my nurse exchanged me with the patient that was supposed to come before. I hear knocking. Surprised, I go to open it. I see a woman standing there who I had never seen before. Hello, are you my name? I'm Camille, a third year nursing student. Your nurse is going to be a bit late today, so she told me to come and start preparing everything. She'll arrive not long after, so don't worry at all. I wasn't really wary at all. I was used to students coming by. I was just a little bit surprised that Sandra didn't warn me. Usually, she would tell me every time in the morning when they were coming, or send me a message later in the evening before. She never leaves a student alone when it's the first time we meet each other either. I told myself she must have just forgotten to tell me. I bring this woman in and show her the way to the treatment room. I take out the things for treatment while she washes her hands. My dog is acting real weird though. He growls at her as soon as she approaches me and then turns around to me. I was so embarrassed that I left him in the living room and closed the door for him to be quiet. I didn't really care what she did. I just let her do it since I was on the phone at the moment. She began to put the IV on the infusion stand and took a syringe. Normally, we rinse my central catheter with a syringe of Phi serum already made. You just have to open the packaging. I see it's not a pre-made syringe, but a syringe she had just prepared. I look up and see that the ampules for my treatments are intact and have not been opened either. Yet before, I had heard the sound of ampules breaking. I was starting to think this was very weird. She started to approach me to inject this mystery syringe when I got a message from my real nurse. I'll be there in five minutes. You can start pulling out the material now. Oh my god, my blood had only run for one spin. I got up and said, I, I have to go to the bathroom. I'll be back in a bit. I ran and locked myself in the downstairs toilet. The whole time my dog was barking and growling. When I opened the door, he followed me straight up so we were both in the toilet together. I sent a message to my nurse. Your student Camille is here already. She already prepared everything. She replied, Who? I started crying in the toilet and was really, really scared. Camille came and called through the door. 
Hey, is everything okay in there? I think she could see I was staying an abnormally long time. Yeah, I I'm almost finished. Then I heard my front door slam shut. Two minutes later, I heard it open again, but this time it was my nurse. I came out of the toilet crying. She asked me to explain what had happened. I told her about everything and showed her to the treatment room. We called the police, they came, examined everything, took samples as well. The syringe and the rest of the things that Camille had prepared. The test results were received a few days after receiving the products in the syringe and the infusion. What she had put into the syringe was a paralyzing agent. She had put a dose that could have paralyzed a man of 120 kilograms or more, and I'm only 40. In the IV was a medicine to lower the heart rate, but so concentrated, it would have stopped anyone's heart. Today, we still don't know who this Camille was, and luckily, I never heard from her again after. I should also specify that she stole all my opioids, but not other things like my tablet which was on the bed, or my computer which was just sitting in the living room. In retrospect, I realized my dog had sensed this person didn't want me to be well. I tell myself I should have watched her, because she was just a student, and my treatments are not paracetamol. I kept wondering what could have happened if I hadn't looked at my phone. I'll give you any updates if I ever have them, and if you have any questions, please don't hesitate. Thanks for reading, and have a good day. This story didn't happen to me, but to a very close male friend of seven years. I was hanging out with him and a couple of other friends, and we were talking about all of our creepy experiences. Here is the story from his perspective. A little bit of background. I was 16 years old when this happened, living in Amman City, the capital of Jordan in the Middle East. I was in high school at the time. I used to weigh 85 kilograms and was 192 centimeters tall. I was a calm but somewhat intimidating person, at least if I wanted to be. I never really messed with anyone though unless I was provoked first. I had just gotten off school this day and decided I wanted to go downtown because I was bored. I really didn't want to stay at home. Actually, I wanted to get some DVDs and games to enjoy later. So I decided to take the bus as I wanted to save on some money. I had to take a taxi to even get to the bus stop though, which was about less than 10 minutes by car. I stopped a coming taxi. Inside the vehicle appeared a light-skinned man with black, greasy hair, wearing a worn-out dark green shirt and an old pair of jeans. He looked to be between the ages of 30 to 34. He addressed me through the passenger window. Hey there, where do you want to go? I need to go to the bus stop that takes me downtown. It's about 10 minutes away from here. Oh, well, I can take you downtown if you'd like. I'm going to pass by that area anyway, so I can drop you off there and you don't even have to pay me. At this point, a red flag should have gone off in my head, but I thought maybe this man just wanted to be kind. I really didn't want to go through the hassle of taking more than one vehicle, so I decided to hop into his car, and we would be on our merry way. Looking back on it now, though, this was a big fucking mistake. Now, there are different ways to head downtown, and I only knew a couple of them. As the man was driving, he started to take different routes that I had never seen before. Since I wasn't familiar with them, no alarm bells were ringing yet. I assumed he must be taking a shortcut to get away from traffic or something. By this point, though, 20 minutes had passed by, and I began to feel very uneasy. Usually, from the bus route I take, you only need 20 minutes to get downtown when there's little to no traffic, but I brushed it off once again. Then suddenly though, the man began to speak in his calm yet very suspicious tone. Hey man, do you mind if I use your phone for a moment? I want to see if you have any videos or music I can send via Bluetooth. I found this to be a very strange request, but as the man was giving me a free ride already, and the fact that I didn't have anything private in my phone anyway, I handed it over to him for a moment, 
I didn't want to be impolite. I was just trying to break this awkward atmosphere. He started to play with my phone for a bit, before proceeding to put it with his own under the empty space of the driver's door handle. Doubt began to circle in my mind. I felt very vulnerable suddenly without my phone. Despite my doubts, though, all I could think to do was stare to the window outside. The feeling of dread and uneasiness only continued to grow. I was not able to tell where we were anymore. The man kept on driving. I started to see many empty roads, with only desert on both the right and left sides. The only things around were various old, worn-out, rusty shipping containers. It was getting very dark at this point. This is where things get even creepier. The man proceeded to pick up his own phone and began to speak to someone at the end of the line, shouting in a very angry voice. I'm gonna fuck you up, you motherfucker. You better prepare yourself. I'm coming to beat your ass, you son of a bitch. As soon as the man ended the call, I knew something was absolutely wrong. Looking more closely at the phone he was holding... I was able to recognize the phone he had was the type that didn't have Bluetooth. Alarm bells started ringing very loudly in my head. That whole call had just come out of nowhere, and I could feel a bunch of dread. My fear was absolutely real. I asked him for my phone back, growing very nervous and impatient with each word escaping my mouth. He looked at me with this kind of funny look and said, I just wanted to see what you've got on your phone, you know. By this point, I had enough. I sternly told him to give it back. The anger and fear was barely contained in my voice. He hesitantly obliged after muttering to himself for a while. I knew at this point I had to get out of this taxi. Feeling a rush of adrenaline, I decided to pretend I was talking to my parents and created a scenario where there was an emergency and I had to get back right now. I began telling the man that someone was waiting for me and needed me immediately. I told him to drop me off right here and right now. I was seeing an upcoming traffic light and then nothing from then on. I knew this was my only chance of escape. I was not sticking around any longer to know where this man was taking me to. God fucking knows where we even were already. As soon as the man stopped at the light, I spoke to him in my most intimidating voice and told him to open the passenger door. Luckily, there were also a couple of cars stopped right next to us. Thank God the man just responded with a menacing look and pressed the unlock button. I sprinted out of that car faster than you could even say, fuck this shit, I'm out. I went straight to a small run-out coffee break stop in the middle of nowhere, as that taxi sped off at 100 miles per hour. I went outside and asked the server if downtown was close by. Completely out of breath and with sweat dripping from my forehead, the server looked at me with a confused and irritated face. You know you're far out of the capital, right? Heading to the city of Zarka? Shit, I thought. Holy shit. I proceeded to call my parents to come pick me up from this middle of nowhere. God knows I'm not taking the taxi to get back home after this, or anytime soon. Thinking about it after a while... It's clear the man had planned on kidnapping me from the start, trying to take away my phone so I wouldn't be able to call for help, and proceeding to pretend he was having a fight with someone on the phone to secretly message his buddies that he was close by with me. Hey there everyone, I wanted to tell you about an experience my brother and I shared two years ago. I've made a post over in r slash paranormal, but I decided to repost it here too. So, we were deciding to go somewhere haunted during the day. There's this old cemetery in Santa Cruz we decided to check out. We go in, walk around, nothing out of the ordinary happened, so we decided to leave. The cemetery is on a supposedly haunted road that leads up into the woods. This road is said to be haunted by a lady in white that tries to hitchhike in your car. I had forgotten this fact until after the day. Alright, so along this road we're driving down, it leads to a forest area. A couple of miles down from the cemetery, you can pull to the side of the road and walk along this hiking trail. 
we decide to hike this very same trail. I'd completely forgotten the road was supposed to be haunted as well, so I wasn't even looking for anything paranormal at all. Anyway, we start hiking this trail in the afternoon. Ten minutes in, we stumble along some abandoned train tracks and a barely standing bridge for the train that used to run along those tracks. It looked really cool, so we decided to head down to investigate this hill right by the bridge that lets you go underneath the dilapidated area. We go down there and start to mess around, looking at all the cool architecture. After we had had our view, we started back up the little hill that led back to the trail. When we finally managed to get to the top, we were a little bit exhausted because the hill was kind of steep. You also had to use the trees around you as leverage to climb back up. We're standing around back on the trail when we both notice something out of the ordinary. We can both hear a voice, almost like a grown man's, shouting and screaming very angrily. When I say angry, I mean absolutely furious. The voice sounded like the rage of a man that wanted to murder someone. We quieted down. We could tell the voice was still very far away. It almost sounded like it was coming from the mountains around us, more than 500 feet away for sure. We both looked at each other. What the fuck is that? We stood around listening for 15 seconds. Next thing we know, the voice had suddenly come down the trail from what sounded like hundreds of feet away to being right down at the very end of it. The inhuman speed with which the voice came closer seemed so unnatural. I noticed it was now coming down the trail as well. I was thinking to myself this voice sounded like it was from someone who was ready to kill. But the weird thing was, the voice was speaking in what I can only say was gibberish. I could not understand one single word it was saying. I instantly got this fight or flight feeling all in my body as the voice started getting very loud and moving closer to us at completely inhuman speeds. I told my brother to pick up some huge sticks with me to defend ourselves. Even though this voice had come out of nowhere and was moving down the trail at lightning speed, I still had the assumption it must be some kind of crazy person out in the mountains having an episode or something. We picked up those sticks and sprinted down the trail back to the car. Now, here's the weird part. As we're running away from this voice that's coming down the other end, I suddenly hear the voice come up right behind us in a single instant. It sounded like he must be no more than 10 feet away, chasing us back to the car. I turned around, even though I didn't want to see. I just had to know how close this psycho was to us. As I looked back though and heard the voice right behind me, I could see no one there. I told my brother to run faster because the voice right behind us was yelling in absolute rage, but I couldn't see anyone behind us. We started picking up speed, and the craziest thing in my entire life happened. The voice panned around us, almost like 360 degree audio. I could hear the voice yelling gibberish right into my ear. Then it started panning to my left through the trees just off the trail. Then it was right in front of us. Then it slid to the right, and then back behind us, all in just a matter of seconds. At this point, my brother and I were obviously very creeped out and ran the rest of the way back to the car. The voice followed us all the way back. I remember hearing it panning around us, reverberating all through the woods, and I started praying to Jesus Christ to help me come out of this alive. After we made it around halfway down the trail to my car, the voice just suddenly disappeared. I remember slowing down completely exhausted, and we started talking about what we'd just heard. I asked my brother if he'd also heard it panning around us in circles, and he said he'd heard the same thing. At that point, I knew I was not hallucinating or imagining things. I asked my brother if he'd heard it as gibberish as well. He said he'd heard the same thing. We finally got into the car and drove the hell out of there in a heartbeat. I remember the car ride was silent for about five minutes as we sat there thinking about what just happened. That's when I remembered. The whole road was supposed to be haunted, not just the cemetery. I had been down that very same trail alone a few months before this experience, and nothing weird happened to me then. 
This was one of the most unexplainable things I ever experienced in my entire life. To this day, I've never been back down that trail, and I never plan on going back either. Everything I've written down is the absolute truth. I haven't altered a single thing. The Santa Cruz area and mountains are known for cults and dark magic being performed in them, I guess. If you have any questions about our experience, feel free to ask. Back in 1998 or 99 or so, I was around 5 or 6 years old and living in a crime and drug ridden part of the downtown area. Our house had a giant backyard that was full of thick jungle like trees and bushes that had been taken over by the earth and also random passerbys. We knew this due to all of the heroin needles that were around and half of a mattress that had once been on the forest floor that had since grown 15 feet into the air with the trees. There was also a path that people would use as a shortcut to the main road, so there was a lot of traffic with shady people passing through. When you're a kid, this is a nightmare of a backyard, so I was spooked since the very moment we moved in. I would complain constantly to my mom about someone watching me from outside my window when I would try to sleep. Once or twice, there had been times of him watching me, and he had shined a flashlight into my room. I had even seen a flash of his face for a brief moment, which I can still picture. His dark eyes burned through me, and for a while I never said anything about this, but eventually I did tell someone. My mom had always said it was just a nightmare, and brushed it off for a week or two while ignoring my relentless complaints. Eventually, after having a fight with me to go to sleep one night, my mom had dragged me outside the next morning to prove me wrong. We went outside to my window, and to her surprise, the grass had clearly been stomped on only outside of my window, to the point where all of it was almost dead, and only mud remained. There were also lots of scratch marks from a tool of some kind outside the window, as if the person had been trying to break in. I was in a basement with one of those tiny windows that don't even open, so breaking in through there was super unlikely, but this incident still shook my family. My mom was very horrified and started making plans to move away, but we were so broke growing up that leaving right away was just not an option. Around that same time, I and my best friend, who was also my next door neighbor, had become pretty much inseparable. We hung out almost constantly and had no sense of danger practically. We would do dumb stuff like go to other neighbors' houses and ask for random candy. Our favorite was this elderly lady who always had hostess cakes for us. We would actually just go inside her house to hang out there. Thankfully, she was unbelievably nice and took care of us in a way. Our parents had no idea we even did this. It was like our little secret. One day, we were playing around the neighborhood, and my mom yelled for me to come home so we could go pick up dinner just around the corner. We were only gone for 15 minutes at most, and when we came back to the house, we were in complete shock. The street was closed off with crime scene tape, and there were two or three news station vans, a dozen police cars at least, and either a life flight copter getting ready to touch down, or a news helicopter. It turned out that while we were gone getting food, a man who was not from the neighborhood, but who had been staying with his mom for the last few weeks, had walked past my best friend's yard and seen her on the phone. She was talking to a friend and making faces or whatever it is young kids do. This man apparently thought she was making fun of him specifically and talking about him on the phone. This man got so upset at the thought of someone making fun of him that he walked back to his mom's house, came back with a butcher knife, and planned to kill my friend for mistreating him. Because of where she was sitting on the porch, she could see him coming back with the knife and ran inside the home and locked herself in the bathroom and called the police with the phone she luckily already had in her hand. Unfortunately, my friend's mom was in the kitchen and was not as lucky. The man took his anger out on her mother and stabbed her so many times I can't even remember the number. I think it was in at least the high 20s. 
Somehow, after the amount of times her mother was stabbed, she still survived, thankfully, and made a full recovery after many surgeries. After his arrest, the story was all over the news. I remember watching it with my mom pretty religiously to make sure my friend's mom would be okay. They posted the man's mugshot, and I remembered the most intense, severe amount of fear flowing through me. The man who had stabbed this woman was also the man who would watch me from outside my window. I later found out that we had actually met this man weeks earlier at the elderly lady's house we frequented for candy. That was her son, and he had initially met us at her house and been keeping an eye on us ever since. He had only just gotten out of prison a month or so earlier and was staying with her since his release. I had never taken note of him when we first met, but maybe if I did, I would have known right away who my night stalker was and could have prevented what happened to my friend's mom. We never did end up moving. My mom figured the danger was already gone with the guy arrested, so we stayed for another year. To this day, I still can't sleep with my blinds open. To the creep who would watch me sleep and try to murder my friend and her mother, I hope we never meet again and that you're still rotting in jail somewhere. This story is about an event that happened to my mother around 1972, when she was 8 years old. She's told me about it since I was young, and she truly thinks about it and is still affected to this day. To set the scene, both of my grandparents ran a restaurant slash gas station in our hometown. They've always run a business of some type since the 50s. This means that a lot of days my mom would have to take the school bus home and stay by herself if my grandma had to stay and help run things, usually no more than an hour or two though. My uncle, her older brother, would usually come home on the bus with her, but he was a little bit older and sometimes had to stay after for football practice. So was the case on the day of the event I'm getting to. So my mother arrived home on this day let herself into the house and started to put away her things. She had just recently received a new puppy, and the first thing she needed to do was take the pup out to the yard to use the restroom. She wrapped the dog up in a white towel, which is important, and walked him outside. As she put the dog down, she shook its hair out of the blanket, flailing it about in the wind. It was then that she noticed the neighbor's son was staring at her from across the street, this guy was in his late twenties and was known to be very strange and severely mentally ill, though in the country mental illness seems to not always be recognized. He would always do psycho shit like killing the neighbor's pigs or skinning stray cats and hanging them from a clothesline in their yard. Real sick shit. My mom said he always creeped her and everyone else out. She said he would stare at her when she would play outside and generally made her very uncomfortable. She said he appeared out of nowhere in his yard that day, and as she shook out the blanket, he began grinning and waving. Feeling more than a little bit shook, she picked up her pup and went inside and locked the door. She had just begun to do some homework, and after about five minutes of work, she suddenly heard a loud knock at the door. She slowly walked over to the window to see who it was, she knew it couldn't be my grandparents because of course they had keys. As she opened the blinds, her eyes locked with those of the creep from across the street. He was already looking into the window. She jumped up and screamed a little as she shut the blinds. She walked over to the door and made sure it was locked. She said he just continued with a slow continuous thud on the door, almost a rhythm of knocking. Then she got really terrified as he began to call out to her through the door. Hi, sweetie. I saw you with your doggy. Let me in to see him. She was in shock. Come on and let me in, sweetie. Please, I just want to see your puppy. In full freakout mode, my mom screamed. You need to leave now. Go back to your house. I don't know you. He kept knocking, though. I can see the fear in my mom's eyes when she describes that part and it gives my whole body chills. He called through the door once again. Damn it, let me in! I saw you waving your flag of surrender! 
I shit you not. The guy thought my mom's shaking hair from this blanket was a flag of surrender and a sign for him to come over. She screamed, I'm calling my dad and the police if you don't leave now. With this, the knocking finally stopped. She tried to catch her breath and shake off the fear. Then she got up from the door and ran to the basement level of the home. It was an old house, so the kitchen and rec room were down there, with the only phone in the house as well. She made it to the phone and began to dial 911. All of a sudden, she heard a shatter from the next room. She looked over to see the crazed neighbor attempting to crawl through the kitchen window. He was ripping down the curtain as his upper body got through, and my mother screamed what was happening to the police on the phone. All of a sudden, he was bleeding from the abdomen where the window glass had cut him, as his lower half couldn't quite squeeze through. Then, my mom began hearing my grandmother's screams. What the hell are you doing? The guy began yelling in pain and squirming at the window, as she hit him from behind with some tool that was laying in the garden on the side of the house, where the entrance to the window was. He managed to wriggle his way out, and bolted to his house. The police came, Grandma called my grandfather, and he arrived as well after shutting down the business as soon as she told him. They arrested him for breaking and entering, and something else that I believe was unrelated. A probation violation or something, I assume. On the day of his court date, he told them the white flag of surrender story, but this was the final nut on his crazy cake, as they put him in a mental institution that very same day. He may have gotten out, but went back because my mother said he later died in an institution as well. Outside the courthouse, the crazy Appalachian redneck family of the creep tried to blame my eight-year-old mother, and the man's father called my mother a harlot. Needless to say, my army-trained grandpa beat the guy's ass on the courthouse steps as the local cops all turned a blind eye. That story has always stuck with me. My mom's had to receive therapy for it so it haunts her a lot as well to this day. We can't help but wonder though, what would he have done to her if my grandma didn't come home at that exact moment? During college, I dated a fairly well-known and talented local musician named Tim. As horrible boyfriends tend to be in the beginning, he was loving, attentive, charismatic, and seemingly a very normal partner. He made me personal mixtapes, cooked me my favorite meals, and even dedicated songs to me at open mics around town. I, young, foolish, and naive, was deeply smitten by his mysterious, dark, and artistic allure. However, over the course of our year-long relationship, his mental health severely declined. He had the ability to appear lucid and normal around other people, but in private he began suffering severe delusions. He would compulsively lie and started creating art that focused heavily on themes of rape and murder. I was worried sick and his condition was exhausting, but I did my very best to be kind, understanding, and supportive. I loved him and believed he shouldn't have to struggle with this mental illness alone. One time, he vanished without a trace for an entire day. I found his apartment empty, lights on, front door wide open, phone still on his nightstand. I took a few deep breaths and called all around the city for hours, before finally discovering he had involuntarily been checked into a mental hospital. I did my best to be strong for him, seeing him every day during supervised visitation hour bringing him his favorite books to pass the time and holding him as he sobbed that it was all a mistake, that he did not belong there. It was surreal to see my gentle, intelligent, and normal, albeit somewhat depressed boyfriend, surrounded by visibly insane long-term psych ward patients. I mean, for real, the place was like something out of a horror movie. In retrospect, none of the staff ever told me the real reason why he was there and I was too polite and naive to ask. Our relationship ended a few months later. I found undeniable evidence he was cheating on me, and secretly relieved I confronted him. I told him to leave my apartment and never come back. He cracked in that moment. The gentle Tim I had known and loved melted away to reveal a new persona, one with dead, wild animal eyes. 
He threatened to kill himself with pills unless I took him back, but I was so extremely done that I just called the police instead. They weren't much help, of course, but Tim did leave after that. I blocked him everywhere and never contacted him again. He would leave me insane voicemails, though, from different numbers every time, for weeks and weeks afterwards. I was relatively unshaken, though, and things eventually returned to normalcy. I graduated and got a sweet job in the same cool college city. Six months later, I woke up to concerned texts from mutual friends saying they didn't want to freak me out, but Tim was off his meds now. He was clearly manic and posting a newly written song all over social media. His best friend, who hadn't been in touch since before the breakup, sent me an apology along with a screenshot of the lyrics. That got my attention. I won't copy and paste them here because they'll lead back to his band camp, but I knew immediately the song was pretty explicitly about my rape and murder, but in a clever, disguised way. A catchy way too, apparently. The bastard. I checked his profiles myself from a friend's account. He was posting dozens and dozens of totally insane rambling statuses, most of them all about me. They flip-flopped between flowery love prose and murder imagery. His friends were reacting with concern, but a few egged him on, probably thinking he was just venting about his ex. I decided it would be best to continue ignoring him, but I saved screenshots just in case. A few days later, while at work, I looked up from my computer to see Tim enter into the far side of the studio. My blood turned to ice. He was talking to my creative director. It looked cordial enough from first glance, until I saw Tim begin to casually scan the studio searching for me. I ducked down and bolted into my favorite project manager's office. I slammed the door and unleashed upon her what must have been a nearly unintelligible explanation of what was happening. I was shaking so hard I could barely even speak. Nancy, though, for her part, was amazing. She understood everything almost immediately. She snuck me out of the building and drove me in her car to the police station, where I showed officers the screenshots and filed the report. My co-workers later told me Tim was there to inquire about the open designer position. Well, he was not a designer. He had brought with him a fake portfolio and an elaborately fabricated work history that sounded completely legit. At the end of his interview, he'd even casually asked if I still worked there. He said we used to collaborate. Oh, and he had written a song just for me. It had been picked up by the local radio this morning. He asked my co-workers to let me know with warmest regards. And that phrase still makes my skin crawl. He then left, found my abandoned car in the parking lot, and paced around it in circles until the police arrived. Unfortunately, he was not enough of a public menace for police to bring him in that day, but the incident did help me to secure a restraining order against him. My company was amazing too, luckily. I was deeply embarrassed about my literally insane ex coming to the studio. The CEO filed trespassing charges against him and created an action plan to keep me safe if it happened again. Not long afterwards, though, I moved to a different city, and that was that. I haven't heard from him since. I discovered the most alarming part later, though. His roommate at the time, Liz, went through a similar experience with him during his breakdown. When we compared notes much later, she said she had seen a large axe in Tim's car the very same week it had all gone down. She was worried about Tim's Facebook activity, so she removed the axe and hid it while he didn't know. Tim was so angry when he found out, he completely trashed their entire house and never came back. If all our timelines are correct, that must have been just before he came into my workplace for his interview. So this story might not really be as spectacular as some of the other ones you've heard though it was disturbing enough that I remember the event in vivid detail. It is somewhat long, but I'll try to condense it to the point it doesn't bore anyone or anything. The cast is myself, my sister S, and the older dude Carl. It's not his real name, but it will be used for the sake of this story. This happened when I was around the age of 14 to 15. I had gone to a theme park, Great America I think, 
when my older sister was around the age of 17 or 18. S pestered me to go on to a ride with her that I was not comfortable riding at the time. Finally, after a bunch of bugging though, I budged and said I'd go with her. While we stood in line, S and I heard Carl yelling about his favorite sports teams to seemingly nobody. He was with a group of girls, so we assumed he was just having a good time with his friends, but apparently that was not the case. Anyway, S and I got on the ride from start to finish. The ride itself was like a pirate ship that basically swung back and forth similar to a pendulum and eventually started to do complete circles, causing passengers to temporarily hang upside down. The ride itself is not really key to the story, beside the fact that it made me extremely nauseous afterwards. After the ride had finished, I noticed that the girls that were previously with Carl had left him while screaming that he was a weirdo. I didn't really pay that much attention to them. My stomach was seriously acting up. I guess I should have though. At the time, S and I were standing on top of a bridge, and I told S I needed a minute to recompose myself. I walked over to the railing of the bridge and leaned over to breathe some fresh air while trying my best not to puke. Basic breathing stuff, really. This is where the story gets weird. While I'm leaning over this railing, I suddenly feel these huge arms wrap around my waist, and then I'm hoisted up into the air. Initially, I'm freaking out trying to comprehend what the hell is actually happening to me in that moment. All I really knew is that now I was in the air, and I was not exactly sure why. I thought whoever was holding me up was going to throw me over the bridge, but instead they put me down on the ground after a moment. I instantly whipped around, only to see Carl there smiling at me. S ran over to stand beside me, and asked Carl why he just yanked me up into the air, I was still in a state of shock at the time and couldn't speak. The following conversation ensued. Why the hell did you pick him up? Oh, well, you know, he looked sick and like he might need some fresh air. Tell me how exactly lifting someone into the air is going to help with a sickness. Carl ignored the question and stared at me, asking me how I was doing. I ignored him in turn and looked away from him, since my sister was now doing all the talking. Come on, kid. Look at someone when they speak to you. You bored or something? I bet you're bored going on rides with your... Uh, sister, friend, sibling. Eh, doesn't matter. I heard her screaming her lungs out on that ride we all just went on. I bet she doesn't want to go on any of the more scary ones. Yeah, she's no fun. You'll probably have to go home soon because of her. Note my sister had been screaming a lot on the ride. She told me she screams on rides because it raises her adrenaline levels causing her to have more fun or something. Leave him alone. What we're doing is none of your business. Oh, but it is. I want everyone that comes to this park to have a great time. I mean, it's great America after all. Tell you what, kid. How about you and I go to the water park and ditch your little friend here? She's not going to have much fun getting wet anyway. But trust me, we will. We can both go on all the water rides that you want, and afterwards I can take you out and grab some lunch maybe. I don't know what you all think about an old random man asking a 14 to 15 year old to go out with him, but I instantly thought this dude was trying to kidnap me. I felt this guy was a danger to myself and possibly S as well, so I made a movement to walk away from him. Carl subtly stepped in front of me to block my path of exit, so I had to think of another way we could get past him. I feigned getting a phone call from my parents. Hi, Mom? Oh yeah, my sister and I were just getting off the pirate ship ride. Wait, you're waiting right outside the ride near the food court? Okay, my sister and I will meet you there right now then. See you soon! I said it in a loud enough voice that Carl could hear everything that transpired, and with newly found confidence I pushed right past him. S and I walked away from Carl in the direction that my feigned mother was apparently waiting. After we walked for about 10 to 15 seconds, we both broke out into a sprint until we reached the park entrance. We tried to tell the front desk people about the guy, but they said since nothing actually happened, they couldn't really do anything. So last night, I was at a classmate's house, working on a group project we have due tomorrow. 
I live in an apartment in the town where our university is located. My classmate lives at his parents' house, which is in the foothills just outside of town. In order to get to the house, you have to drive along a relatively secluded and narrow two-lane road for about five or six miles. We started working on the project at about 6 p.m., and I ended up hanging around for a while after we had finished our working. I left his house pretty late, at about 11 or so, and started down the road back towards town. I didn't quite realize how tough it would be though to navigate this road at night. There were no streetlights and the road was completely unkempt and riddled with potholes. On top of this, I had no cell service either, so I had to drive very slowly to make sure I didn't blow out one of my tires since I had just used my spare a couple of weeks back. I figure I was about three miles from the house when I rounded a tight corner and saw a pickup truck with a camper shell parked diagonally across the road. The manner in which it was parked completely impeded my path forward, and I couldn't drive around it either. There was a gully on both sides of the road. The only way for me to go at this point was backward, where there was a pull-off that I could use to turn my car around. At first, I couldn't see inside the cab, but when I turned on my high beams, I saw there was a man slouched over in the driver's seat, his head resting against the steering wheel as if he had just been knocked out by a very bad accident. I immediately sensed that something was wrong here, the way his car had just coincidentally come to rest in a position that totally blocked off the road was a big red flag for me. I had heard stories before of people playing dead in the road as a way to lure unsuspecting people out of their cars so they could try and rob them. I decided, fuck this shit. I elected to go back to my classmate's house and explain exactly what was going on. I threw the car into reverse and kept my eyes darting back and forth between my rear view and that truck. I looked and saw that I was almost at the pull-off where I could turn around finally. When I looked back at that truck, my heart skipped about five beats. The man who had just moments ago been slouched over in the driver's seat was now sprinting at my car at a hurried pace, while a few other men jumped out of the camper shell and started moving towards me as well. I panicked and accelerated backwards into the pull-off, which messed up the undercarriage of my car pretty bad. As I put it into drive, the guy had already reached my passenger side door and was tugging on the handle. Thank the Lord I had remembered to lock it. I only caught a brief glimpse of him, but his face appeared to be scabbed and leathery. Definitely a meth head or some sort of drug abuser. I sped away and didn't slow down at all until I reached the house, constantly checking my rear view to see if they were following. Thankfully, they didn't tell me, and when I reached the house, I explained what had happened to my classmate. We called the cops together. I was extremely grateful my buddy's parents were kind enough to let me stay that night. They didn't find anyone on the road matching the description, but I filed an incident report. They told me they would be on the lookout for similar vehicles and suspicious activity. But holy shit, I'm still so shaken up over it. I kept getting the same adrenaline rush I got when I saw the guy charging me whenever I think about it. Please share any similar experiences you've had. I would appreciate a good reader discussion to help me clear my headspace on this incident. To put this into context, I'm an 18-year-old girl living in New Zealand. I suffer from anxiety and shut down in stressful situations. I tend to become rather overwhelmed when I'm not sure how to deal with something. This story happened yesterday, whilst I was waiting at my bus station to catch a ride home. I'd had a very long day at work, and my legs were very much in pain. All I wanted to do was get home and watch some YouTube or read something in bed or something. It was getting quite dark and the sun was almost completely down. As I was listening to some music in a rather deserted area of the bus station, a man considerably larger than myself sauntered up and sat down directly next to me on the bench. I didn't really think much of this at first. To put this into perspective, I'm roughly 55 kilograms. He must have been at least 100 and could have very easily overpowered me. 
I noticed out of the corner of my eye that this man was staring at me. I began to feel a little bit uncomfortable and pegged it up to maybe him looking at my mask or something. It was rather nondescript and just black. I ignored this and acted busy on my phone to avoid conversation. As I said, I'd had a long day at work and would rather not be bothered. The man began to talk to me, and I pulled out my AirPod to listen to what he was saying to me. The AirPod fell and landed on the ground, which he picked up for me. He held onto it and stared at it for a few moments, before handing it back to me. I was already starting to get bad vibes from this man. The conversation went something like this. Your eyes are so beautiful. Did you get them from your mom or your dad? Uh, I don't know, my mom, I guess. I kept my replies short to signify I wasn't in the mood for talking, but he continued nonetheless. What bus are you catching? Where do you live? I laughed nervously and told him I didn't feel very comfortable sharing that information. I told him it was farther up north. Completely unprompted, he then said, Why? It's not like I'm going to rape you. Isn't it really fancy up there? This is where I began to feel seriously uncomfortable and began to shake. He asked if I had a boyfriend, to which I said yes. He proceeded to ask if I planned to marry him, to which I laughed and said yes again. Oh, it kind of sounds like you're just rooting him. Are you sure you want that? I was shocked and looked at him again. Yes, I do plan to marry my partner. What business is it of yours? How old are you? I don't know what came over me, but I told him I was 21 to make it come across I was old enough to stand up for myself. Are you on the pill? Do you use condoms instead? I wanted to walk away, but I was grounded to that bench and couldn't move a muscle if I tried. I was uncomfortable and confused as to why he was getting so close to me. Do you have someone waiting for you at the bus stop or are you walking home? How far do you live? This is the question that made everything click into place and I realized this guy definitely had malicious intent. He was not being friendly. This man was going to follow me home and either rape me or kidnap me. I started to really panic and started desperately looking for onlookers. A young man, possibly my age, walked out of the public restroom. He had overheard this conversation and was looking at the predator rather skeptically. I knew then I'd at least have someone to help if I just asked for it. In the moment, though, I didn't. By this point, though, I recalled a video from r slash about a highly pregnant woman and her daughter being followed to their car in an empty car park in the dark by an older man. This lady was stressfully trying to find her keys in her purse as this man was standing beside her daughters on the opposite side of the car, making small talk with them. I remember someone commented on this submission saying it was a popular thing that he was waiting for her to unlock the car so he could get in and control her via threats to her children. It occurred to me that maybe I could skip my bus and catch another one instead. I did this exactly. He kept trying to ask where I lived and I kept refusing to tell him where. He also continued to ask how far I lived from the stop and if anyone was waiting for me. I deflected all of his questions and after 40 minutes he began to get grumpy and walked away from the station. He wasn't there to catch a bus at all, but to prey on young women at the bus stop. I caught my bus when it arrived a few minutes after he left. I ran home, where I completely broke down and cried in the arms of my partner. This morning I was so stressed I contemplated taking the day off work and staying in bed for the rest of it to cry. I was petrified. In the end though, I still ended up going and I'm at work sharing this story. At about 8 p.m. last night, yeah, what a spooky time, I was walking with a friend of mine, Sally, about a mile to the closest cafe. We're both girls in our early 20s, Neither of us own cars, and Sally didn't have her Opal card, which is the Aussie version of an Oyster card, basically an automatic ticketing system for public transport. This meant that walking was our only option. It's summer over here right now, so it was still fairly well lit. We were walking down main roads as well, so we weren't too concerned for our safety. We finally arrived at this cafe and sat down together. I was paying, but I only had my credit card with me. Sure enough, the restaurant was cash only. 
Sally was on the phone when I got back from the counter, so I gestured for her to stay put and guard the spot while I went to go grab some cash. This was my home suburb, so I know there's no ATMs around. My best bet was a gas station about a block away. I'm doing a light jog so I wouldn't keep Sally waiting, when a balding, sweating man, probably in his late 40s, with a tank top and no shoes, came running behind me as I passed the corner of the block. He began walking behind me for about 100 meters. I really didn't think too much of it at first. The gas station was the next building along, and it seemed like he had just come out of a very nice suburban house along the street. It wasn't the witching hour yet either, so I just assumed he was in a hurry to get to the gas station like I was. He didn't even cross my mind as I entered the tiny convenience store, nor did he attempt to follow me in. In my peripheral vision, I could see him walk right past the door and out of sight. I began to look around for an ATM that they sometimes have inside. No such luck, unfortunately. I went up to this man in his 30s behind the desk and reluctantly asked if they were able to do cash out. He smiled politely at me. Of course. Is that man with you, by the way? I have no idea who he's talking about at first. He pointed to the man from earlier, though, who was now pacing around outside the store. Keep in mind, he didn't look at all menacing. He wasn't just going back and forth right outside the door or anything. He was drifting in the space outside, from the pavement to the gas pumps to the storefront, seemingly aimlessly. I assumed he must be on drugs or something. I told the clerk no, not thinking very much of it at all. Oh, well, he was really staring at you before, you know. I thought he might have been your dad or something. I laughed it off. Honestly, I was not too concerned. He was just ambling around outside. I couldn't imagine him having a fixed gaze on anything. I thanked the clerk for the cash, but before I turned away to leave, he said, Why don't you just wait here for a second? Let's see if he leaves first. We waited there for a few minutes together in silence, as the guy began to pace back and forth directly against the front wall of the store, looking straight ahead and never inside. It still looked like the man was just on a drug-induced shamble and seemed harmless. Not once did he seem to even attempt to look at me, so I figured it would be safe to just slip out the door and walk back to the cafe in the fairly bright light of dusk, especially since Sally was texting me at this point, rushing me to come back. I thanked the guy at the desk once again for his concern, and assured him that I did not know the guy and was not involved in some weird scheme to rob the store or something. As I started to head for the door, the clerk called out and asked if I wanted him to walk out with me. I said I should be alright, and began walking away from the block. As I left the store, though, the drifting man stopped pacing immediately, and began to make a beeline for me from the other end of the building. I seriously hadn't given a single thought to this guy at all up until this point, but for the first time he was now heading in a straight line toward me. The hairs on the back of my neck immediately stood straight up. I started power walking so he wouldn't think I was actively trying to escape him, still trying to convince myself I was just being paranoid and should be more casual instead. I didn't look behind me to see how close he was. I'd reached the pavement on the other side of the gas pumps when I heard the store clerk sprint outside. Go! Run! I made a break for it, looking over my shoulder. He'd grabbed the man by his arms from behind. The balding man was not even glancing at the attendant or trying to escape. He just stood there watching me run away. That's pretty much the end of the story, folks. I kept running until I crossed the road, then turned around and stood still. The cashier was now holding firmly onto the odd, staring man. We shared a brief glance in bewilderment, not really knowing what to do. He made a hand gesture to go. I gestured my thanks and ran away. I got back to Sally with the cash and bought the food, before walking back home a different way. To set the tone for this, I always hated the town I lived in. I moved there alone when I was 18 for college, and very quickly regretted it. It was a decent-sized town, but full of not-so-decent people. Nearly every gas station was robbed frequently. There were shootings all the time in broad daylight, 
robberies, kidnappings, you name it. For the first three years, I lived with roommates on a side of town that wasn't particularly awful. It was just a bit sketchy. How lucky. When I was making decent enough money, I decided to move out on my own. The house was tiny, maybe 500 square feet if that. It was super old and poorly built as well. I was the only person living there, so I didn't really mind how small it was. What originally sold me, though, was that it was right in the middle of nowhere. It was surrounded by a bunch of fields and wooded areas, with only a scant few houses nearby. Considering I despised being in the town itself due to the continuous paranoia of being mugged or shot for no reason, I loved the idea of living where nobody was out there. At the beginning of July, I moved in. Everything seemed super swell, minus not being able to get good internet. A month went by and everything was still super good for me. I decided to get a dog to keep me company. He also loved the place and spent large amounts of time lounging about the yard and trying to convince the nearest neighbor to walk over and pet him. This is in fact a detail that will be important later. After about two months of living there though, I started to notice things were out of place sometimes. Something to note is that an old roommate of mine was using my spare room as a storage space until he got moved himself, so he had a key to move his stuff there but never really came by. He kind of popped in once every other week or so to maybe grab something from storage and usually let me know beforehand. Now though, I'd come home to my kitchen chair being obviously pulled away from my table, or a new bowl in the sink, things like that. They were such small, innocuous things, at first I wrote it off as my roommate swinging by, or perhaps something I'd forgotten because I was really tired. Then though, my dog started to develop this crazy bad separation anxiety. Up until now, he didn't even care when I left. He'd just lay on the couch and chew his toys all day. He never barked, never did anything weird. All of a sudden though, he began acting really awful every time I tried to leave. He'd literally cram his body through the door as I was closing it, screaming and barking, and would not stop until I came back inside with him. He didn't want me to leave him there alone at all. I couldn't afford a kennel for him, so I decided one day I'd put a movie in while I was out, thinking maybe the sound of people talking might keep him calmed down. I only had to finish one task at work, and I knew I'd be home early that day, so I popped in a copy of Hamlet. I know, it's pretty boring, but I chose it because the copy I have is five hours long. I knew it would still be playing when I came back. Flash forward three hours though. Long before that copy of Hamlet should have been over. When I walked through the door, not only was the movie not playing, but the TV and all the appliances were completely off. I immediately called my roommate and asked if he had been over. He wasn't even in town at the time. I explained the TV situation to him. He shrugged it off as the TV powering off when it idled for a while. Even though this could be true, there were several reasons I knew this wasn't the case. One, it was not idling, a five hour movie was supposed to be playing. And two, even if it shut off by itself, my Xbox that was playing it wouldn't have turned off too. I had once left it on by accident for weeks while I was out of town or whatever, and it was still on when I came home always, but everything was completely powered down this time. The weird thing was though, none of my stuff was missing. The door was even fully locked when I entered. I eventually convinced myself perhaps it was a weird shortage with the Xbox or whatever, and shrugged it off. That is, until my dog started acting even weirder. Remember earlier when I mentioned he used to play with the neighbor? Well all of a sudden, if she walked by the house while he was out, He'd start screaming and running at me away from her. This was incredibly weird to me, and made me suspicious of her as well. I put some cheap alarms on all my doors, the kind that go off when they're opened, and slept with my pistol handy. The second night the alarms were on my doors, I was woken up by the one on the back door going off. I flew out of bed with my pistol, trying to convince myself that I was about to shoot some intruder. Once I got there, it was shut though, and there was nobody around. The alarm had been knocked all the way across the room though. The door would have had to been opened really hard for it to be chucked like that, 
It couldn't have fallen off and just landed there. The weirdest thing was, though, the door was still locked, but not the way I had locked it. I always locked the knob and the deadbolt, but upon checking my lock after this, only the doorknob was locked. The police wouldn't do very much, as I had no witnesses, no leads, and they didn't have much to go on. Needless to say, I changed the lock shortly thereafter. I didn't have any noticeable problems inside after that, but I later found out my close neighbor that my dog now hated had previously lived in the house I was renting. The locks had never been changed. I have no way to really prove my theory, but it's pretty obvious she had a key and was coming and going as she pleased. The why, though, I really can't figure out. None of my stuff ever went missing, not even the money. The most unsettling part for me, though, is that she tried to come in at night until the alarm scared her off. How many times had she come into my house at night while I was asleep, and why had she done so? In 2012, I worked at a tanning salon in a strip mall. It was across the street from a Walmart that was always crawling with strange people. The strip mall that my salon was located in was very poorly lit at night as well. There was a sushi restaurant and an auto zone, but other than that, the other stores were all vacant. We were open until about 10 p.m., while the other two businesses closed at 8 or 9. The salon was never overwhelmingly busy, so there was always only one person working at a time. My best friend also worked at this company, and the salon she worked at was a 15-minute drive from mine. This detail will be important later. I'm a bit of a night owl myself, so usually I work the 3 to 10 p.m. shift every weeknight. I'm a bit of a night owl myself, so usually I work the 3 to 10 shift every weeknight. At some point in time, I started to get these strange phone calls at exactly 8 p.m. every single night. It started off strange, but nothing to be alarmed about. The first time he called went something like this. Hi, I'm conducting a survey on women's shopping habits. I figured calling a tanning salon run by women would be a good place to start. We'll also send you a gift if you participate in the survey. Okay... Do you typically wear jeans, yoga pants, leggings, skirts, shorts, dresses, perhaps? Feel free to list each of these that you wear. I wear all of those occasionally. Great! Now, when you wear dresses or skirts, do you ever wear pantyhose? Not unless it's winter. So, how many tights or pantyhose pairs do you own altogether? Uh, I don't know, like five, I guess? This is really great information. So, would you be interested in us sending you some free sample pantyhose? Uh, no thanks. I'm not really interested. I don't think I'd wear them enough to really care. Okay, okay. We totally understand. Would it be okay if I called you for a survey in the future as well? Uh, alright, if you need to. When do you typically work? Every weeknight. Alright, great. I'll talk to you soon. I shouldn't have given some random person my work schedule, but they were already calling my job, so there was no denying this person could easily find me if they really wanted. Honestly, I didn't really think anything was weird about that call at all at the time. Later in the month, we had a store meeting, and the weekend sales associate said she had gotten a few weird calls from a guy breathing heavily and asking her strange questions. She didn't go into much detail though, so I didn't make the connection at the time. The next few times he called, it seemed normal enough as well. One survey was on skirts and skirt length and brands. The next was about dresses and what type of brands women prefer. He kept offering to send me pantyhose though. I kept telling him I didn't need them. He would always just laugh it off and say, Okay, I just wanted to make sure. I have to offer them every call as our protocol, you see. The very last survey he called to have me do, though, really started to scare me. When you wear dresses and skirts, do you wear panties with them? Yeah. What material are they? Silk? Satin? Cotton? Lace? Uh, I'm not really comfortable answering this question. I think I'm done with all these surveys. Oh, come on. 
I just want to know what you wear under that dress. I'll bring you some nylons and panties right now. I hung up and freaked out. I called my friend at the other salon and told her about what just happened. She told me the same guy had been calling her location as well, trying to talk to girls about pantyhose and panties. He had even described to one girl exactly what she was doing while she was on the phone with him. The salon she worked at had glass front windows, with the desk facing toward them. My salon also had this setup, but the desk faced the wall instead. The next few nights were hell. He realized none of us were picking up the calls anymore unless he blocked the number first. We had to answer blocked calls because if it was another customer and they complained, we would be the ones getting in trouble. He started changing up the time of night he called, spoofing fake numbers. His calls were getting creepier and creepier as well. Heavy breathing, telling us exactly what we were wearing, saying he was taking pictures of us and imagining us in our panties. Really creepy stuff. I was starting to be afraid to be at work. I made sure to be on the phone with my friend from the other salon every night, for my last hour or so. One day, though, the calls just suddenly stopped. I'll never know if this next incident was related to this, but I will forever think it was. My salon had a waiting area by the desk when you walked in. Then it had a very long hallway with 20 rooms. The last two rooms were the spray tan rooms, which needed to be sprayed down each night at close. At the very end of the hallway was a door leading to the dumpsters in the back. To the left of that door was the washer and dryer. Now, at a tanning salon, you generally see the same kind of people. Women of all shapes and sizes, metrosexual men, really buff guys, and guys who come along dragged by their girlfriends. You never saw overweight, dirty, or middle-aged men coming in to get their tan on. This particular night, 20 minutes to close, a guy fitting that exact description walked in. My heart sank. I had the immediate gut feeling that this was the phone creep. I acted normal and asked him his last name. He told me he'd never been there before, so I explained to him how much a single tan on a regular night cost and explained our packages as well. I could see immediately though my words were falling on deaf ears. He opened his mouth wide and wagged his tongue out, breathing heavily. It didn't sound like the guy from the phone's voice, but people could easily change their sound. He asked for the most basic bed for five minutes. Huge red flag. Why did you even come in then if you're only going to come for five minutes? I put him in the bed and immediately got on the phone with my friend from the other salon. She was the manager there, so she decided to close shop early and race over to me just in case I needed her. I had the back door propped open, as it was hot as hell inside the salon. I wanted to get a cool breeze going while I cleaned the rooms. The dryer was also running, which could have impacted my hearing. I was in one of the rooms near the front sweeping, when I realized it had been 15 minutes and I hadn't ever heard this guy walk out the front door yet. I had hoped he would just leave while I was sweeping up in the room so I wouldn't have to deal with him. I go down the hall to listen outside the room he was in, only to discover the room was empty. He clearly had not even used the bed, as there were no marks or anything and the glass remained completely clean. I called out to see if he was still there. Sir? No response. I called my friend immediately. I suddenly had this horrible feeling of dread. Where are you? I yelled into the phone. I'm right here. I'm pulling up right now. Relax. Did he leave yet? I frantically explained to her what happened and told her loudly so he would hear if he was still in the store. I told her to bring her bat as well. My friend came rushing in three minutes later holding a steel bat. In that moment, it was horrifying. But thinking about it now, it was hilarious. She's five foot nothing and 100 pounds, and I'm about the same size. Together, we started going into the rooms one by one. When we made it to the sixth room, we heard the back door slam shut hard. We ran to it and locked it. We still checked the other rooms, but we both know what had happened. He had been hiding in one of the empty ones and bolted when he realized we were searching room to room for him. I don't know what his plans were for me that night and why he hid in an empty room, but I'm thankful my friend was there to help me.
I was 12 and my older sister and I were home alone for the weekend. I was waiting for a friend to come pick me up and was getting quite restless waiting. There was suddenly a knock on my door. I remember thinking it was my friend. I ran to answer it without even checking through the peephole. A man was standing there instead, holding a clipboard. He said he needed to come inside and check our gas meter. I was entrenched in the disappointment of my friend still not having arrived, so I just told him, Yeah, sure, whatever you need to do. I didn't notice at the time, but he was not dressed as a city official. Instead, he had on a green and purple shirt with bold stripes, just like the host of Blue's Clues. He came in and immediately went up the stairs to where our bedrooms were. He walked into the open door of my room, the typical girly girl room with pink and glitter scattered around. Thank God my sister came downstairs at almost that exact moment. She exclaimed in surprise. Oh, that's Daphne's dad, right? Why is he going upstairs? I complained about how Daphne wasn't here yet and was going on about how unreliable she was when my sister cut me off immediately. Wait, wait. If Daphne's not here, then who is that? He's here to read the gas meters, he said. Her face turned white immediately. She flung open the front door and dragged me outside, hand clamped over my protesting mouth. Our gas meters are outside, she whispered to me. Neither of us had a cell phone since it was the 60s, and obviously we were not going back in the house to call authorities on the landline phone. My ever-resourceful sister, though, had a stroke of genius in that moment. A man happened to be walking right by our house. She motioned him to come over. She called out loudly, directly into the house. Oh, hey, Dad! It's good you're home now. A man from the city is here to read the gas meter upstairs. Just like she'd hoped, the man on the street said, What are you talking about? The man in the striped shirt, though, immediately bolted out of the house. The man on the street got extremely worried and kept asking us if he were okay, if we needed him to stay and wait in the yard with us until our parents got home. He was very sweet, actually, in all honesty. We were so startled, though, that we barely had the chance to thank him before we rushed inside and slammed the doors and windows shut locking them tight. As irate as my sister was that I'd let some stranger into the house, she begged me not to call the authorities. My parents had left her in charge, and she was worried she'd be in trouble. I also didn't want to catch any heat from carelessly allowing some rando in, so I was on the same page. Three weeks later, though, a girl in our community went missing. Same M.O. She was home alone, and authorities found the door wide open, with no signs of forced entry. My sister and I discussed our options, but deep down we knew we had no choice but to come clean. We told the police everything we experienced. I don't know if it ever helped, but they did tell us they had reason to believe it was the exact same man. They also tracked down the man who helped us out on the street that day. Turns out we already knew him. He worked at the local butcher shop and we just hadn't recognized him that day. He was lifelong friends with our family after that. Our parents were of course mortified. They weren't angry at us particularly, they were glad we were okay, though they did review all the rules of caution and never left us home alone for a while after. They found the girl in the end. They said she'd been held for a few days and then burned alive. They never caught the man, but fear not. He was in what appeared to be his early 30s in the 1960s, so, in any case, he has to be dead by now. This past New Year's Eve, I went away for the night with my two best friends, and one of their moms as well. I was home for the holidays from college, and my friend Sarah invited me to go to Palm Springs to celebrate New Year's with her mom and our friend Rachel. I didn't really have any other plans, so I decided it would be a good idea to go with them. We went to a really cool city about an hour from where we all live, that was very big on shopping and resorts as well. We planned to have a pretty calm night all in all. Watch the ball drop at a block party thing downtown, have a few drinks at the bar. Since we were on the west coast, the ball drop was at 9 or so. 
This meant that about eight, we ventured out from our hotel, walking to the block party that was only about a mile away. On the way there, we passed by a very lively bar. We decided to stop by real quick. We spent about 15 minutes dancing, but didn't really get any drinks. It was a gay bar, and Sarah and Rachel being gay. They were pretty stoked on finding this place. They wanted to come back after the ball drop, even though it was about 90% men there. We continued on to the block party, got some dinner, and grabbed a glass of champagne. The ball dropped, and they had a DJ as well, so we spent about an hour there dancing with everyone. After we got pretty tired of this, we decided to head back to the bar and hang out there until about midnight or so. Once we got there, Sarah's mom paid for a drink for each of us, but left soon after that because she was really tired. It was about 10.30 at this point. Sarah, Rachel, and I are all enjoying our drinks and having a lot of fun dancing. Rachel then tried some of mine since it was one she had never had before. I constantly have my guard up drinking in public, and I felt safe at this bar because it was 90% gay men as well, who I thought would have no interest in me. I went back to the bar to get a second drink, and that's the very last thing I remember. The rest I've gathered from Sarah and Rachel. Almost immediately after grabbing that second drink, I asked Rachel to go to the bathroom with me, because I was not feeling well at all. Even though I had been completely fine just 10 minutes before this, once in the bathroom, I collapsed on the floor and became almost unresponsive. Rachel was now extremely worried and somehow dragged my half-lifeless body out to where Sarah was waiting for us. Security, upon seeing my condition, assumed I was wasted and asked us to leave immediately. Sarah and Rachel decided to take me back to the hotel about a half mile away. By this point, I was completely unconscious though, and there were barely any sounds escaping from my mouth. They saw someone leave the bar at the same time as us and began walking near all three of us, but they were too preoccupied with trying to keep my dead weight, lifeless body off the ground. At one point, I even vomited all over everything, both of them, the sidewalk, etc. The next part of the story we had to get from Sarah, and Rachel doesn't have memory of this either. Still struggling to carry me, the man they saw leave the bar approached them. He was hitting on Rachel, trying to get her to go grab a drink with him. She was very agitated and told him to leave. Her friend needed help right now, obviously. He would not take no for an answer and followed us down the street. A middle-aged woman witnessed this and came up and told the man off. Something along the lines of stop harassing these young women or I'll call the police. He basically ran away after that. Next, by some miracle, an EMT and his wife enjoying the holiday ran into us as well. He checked me out to make sure something wasn't majorly wrong and then carried me the rest of the way to my hotel and into the room. My friends could barely even hold up my weight. They thanked the man profusely, and him and his wife left. This is where Rachel's memory suddenly kicks back in. Only five minutes later, they get a knock on the door. It's the EMT and his wife again. They'd come by to let us know that a man had followed us into the hotel. They'd just seen him hop over the gate and start making his way directly to our room. My friends called hotel security, but they were unable to find the guy in the end. My friends didn't get a good glimpse of him, but I'm 100% sure it was that same man from earlier. I spent the rest of the night vomiting everything in my body and dry heaving after that. I woke up the next morning in a pile of pillows and blankets on the bathroom floor. My very last memory was at the bar getting that second drink. My friends filled me in on everything that had happened. Feeling like crap, I thought I must have just drank way too much, but I had never blacked out before in my life, and the amount of drinks I'd had, two in two hours, didn't add up to me being completely knocked out like that. We decided my first drink had to have been drugged, and since Rachel had some of it, it affected her as well somewhat, even though she was still fully functional. I'm sure that man that was talking to Rachel and then followed us back was the one who had slipped something into my drink. To this day, I really don't know how that could have even happened though. I got my drink directly from the bar and never even set it down once. My guess was that it was already in the cup when I received it. Thankfully, I had a really good friend and lots of kind strangers protecting me that night. But it still keeps me up at night, thinking what could have happened under different circumstances.
So this was back in January of 2018. It took me a few years and a little bit of therapy to even be able to talk about this. I'm okay now though, so I thought I would share this. It's a little bit long, but buckle up. I was part of a study abroad program in Bangkok, which was awesome for the record. Not long after being there, my fellow students and I went out for a night on the town. After a night of a bit of drinking and running amok in Bangkok, we somehow ended up in this back alley illegal strip club. Here's where I think it's important to mention that I'm female, and I was the only female in the group that night. I saw things I will never unsee in the 15 minutes we were there, and it honestly keeps me up at night every once in a while. Let's just say it was pretty blatantly obvious the woman did not want to be there. Very quickly, I also did not want to be there. About five minutes into this really, really misguided decision, I realized two guys from my group were talking to a guy in a red polo shirt. Oh man, there were many guys in red polo shirts scattered throughout the room, and none of them looked very pleasant to be around. One of my friends, let's call him M, came back over to me laughing, pointed back at the red shirt guy, and said, Hey, he's trying to get me to sell you to him for $10 American. I keep telling him you're worth more, but 10 is the highest he says he'll go. I've never noped out of a situation so fast in my entire life, and everyone went with me. I'm an experienced traveler, so I did take the opportunity to use this as a learning experience for M. I taught him how quickly these situations can go south, and how important it is to be on your guard always in a foreign country. I thought he'd learned his lesson. We'd all gotten out safe, so no harm, no foul. I'll admit though that after that I did become a little more withdrawn from the group. Everyone would go out partying every single night. I went to school, occasionally ate out, and did some daytime shopping at the markets, or maybe hung out in a high-end spa near the hotel. For like 20 to 50 American dollars you can get pampered like a queen, and a broke college kid of course took advantage of that. Two other girls joined me on my adventures, and we had a pretty great time overall actually. Before we were scheduled to return back to the States, my other classmates, okay, okay, it was all M, finally convinced me to go out for a night on the town with them to some strip. People were eating scorpions on a stick, some dumb girl from Australia who had joined our group took a hit of some gas they were selling on the street and vomited everywhere, and people were packed elbow to elbow. There was a lot of rave-style lights and music. Big sensory overload. I figured I was with a group of 20 people from the US and Australia. If there was a time to drink and party in a foreign country, this would be it. So the drinking started, and the partying began. With drinking, of course, eventually comes the need for a restroom as well. I told M I was going to find one, and I would be right back. M chose that moment to be a diva though, starting to hammer back drinks and demanding everyone's attention. I must have been gone 10 minutes tops. I come back and everyone is gone. I got the story later that the Aussies left and the rest of my group had to chase down M when he ran off in a drunken display for attention. I walk over to the entrance of this strip where we all dropped off and sit down on a picnic table near all the cabs to wait for my group. An hour goes by, two hours, two and a half hours goes by. It's almost 1 a.m. now. The street is still packed, but I've seen not one single person from my group. I was starting to get a little bit concerned. I realized I had no idea where we were, really. The others had been coming to this strip every night, but this was my first time. Fuck. Okay, experienced traveler time. I didn't have the address to the hotel written down in English or in Thai, and I don't speak Thai either. Luckily, I hadn't had a drink in two and a half hours, so I was getting pretty sober at this point. I had been there long enough to know that taking a tuk-tuk, those open wheelie cab things, were much cheaper than taking an actual cab. I had not been there long enough though to realize that taking a tuk-tuk at 1am alone as a female was a very bad idea. I showed the driver my room key to tell him where I needed to go. What a naive child I was. We negotiated a price and I hopped in. He started going the opposite direction from where our cab came in from to drop us off initially. We took a highway to get there, but my tuk-tuk driver was on all residential streets. Then he wandered into an alley. 
Okay, I was on red alert right now. He stopped. I poised, ready to strike should I need to. Next to me on my left, a garage door rolled up, and a group of men walked out, one of who was holding a blue purse. I stuck around just long enough to see him start walking over and unzipping said purse as he moved. I bolted. I barely managed to shake off the tuk-tuk driver. I just kept putting one foot in front of the other, crying because I couldn't breathe. I thought to myself I was going to die because I could never be bothered to go to a gym. I kept running and running, until finally I saw it. The familiarity of home. A 7-Eleven in the middle of this Thai neighborhood. I was hysterical as I sprinted through that door like the Kool-Aid man himself. The cashier started yelling at me to get out in Thai. I was desperately yelling in English that my tuk-tuk driver had just tried to sell me, and I was not going anywhere. We go at it for a minute or two of me begging him to help me, when this tiny little four-foot elderly Thai woman came up to me with an equally tiny grocery card full of two-liter bottles of Pepsi. She took my hand and my room key. She never said a single word to me. Not one. She led me outside, hailed a cab, and had a solid 60-second conversation with the driver then pushed me into the back seat. The scariest part of my entire night, though, was that 15-minute cab ride back to my hotel. I couldn't possibly know if that little Thai woman had just helped me or sold me out to the highest bidder. The cab driver had to stop and ask for directions about three minutes from the hotel, so that was probably the moment I knew this was going to affect me mentally for a while. The ride cost me 10 American, and I tipped him $60, you know, for not trying to sell me as a slave. This happened a couple of years ago, but I finally feel like I'm ready to talk about it. In 2016, I had just turned 18 years old and was in my second semester of community college. I was lucky to get to take a few specialized classes that were requirements from my major. These classes required me to drive about 45 minutes every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday to the main campus of my community college system. And that's relevant because I was going to a town I did not know very well, and I also didn't know anyone who lived there either. There was this man in my class named Eddie. He was a big guy in his late 40s or so. I'm all of five foot nothing, and at the time I was about 130 pounds. That is to say, I was pretty small and defenseless. We spent a lot of time in the lab for these classes, and he was always stationed right across from me. I was a bit more naive and unsuspecting at that time, and wanted to be nice. I talked with him and my other classmates quite a bit, and was a lot friendlier to him than I would be nowadays. He started being overly friendly to me, and would stand too close or ask too many personal questions. He'd flirt with me in the class as well, to the point it seemed to make other people around uncomfortable to watch. He started to stare at me a lot, with this really intense look that honestly kind of scared me. Of course, being young and not wanting to hurt his feelings, I decided to ignore it as best I could. I told my boyfriend about it, but again, Eddie hadn't actually ever done anything wrong to me, so there wasn't a lot I felt like I could do in return. A few weeks after this all started, all of us were hanging out in a small break room type area, studying for an exam for our next class. It was about 30 minutes away or so. I was sitting at one table chatting with some middle-aged woman in my class, and Eddie was at the next table over messing around with his phone. I announced that I was going to get something from the vending machine and stood up to leave. As I did so, he tried and failed to discreetly turn his phone toward me and snapped a picture of me as I walked away to the machine, got my drink, and bent over to pick it up. I realized what was going on as I was walking back, with him still taking photos of me. I shot him a dirty look. He put his phone away and just sat there staring at me from then on. I was trying my best to look pissed, but honestly I was just really freaked out. Who just takes pictures of people like that? I excused myself on the table and called my boyfriend near tears, telling him about this weirdness. He was angry and said that I needed to tell someone, but I said no because I didn't want to make a scene. He tried his best to comfort me as much as he could, but I had to go to class soon afterwards. Our last class finished at about 9pm, and since it was January, 
it was completely pitch black out when we all walked out to our cars. I was actually in the middle of texting one of my guy friends about what had happened when Eddie walked up to my car, stopped for a moment, looked at me through my windshield, and then slowly kept walking, watching me through my driver's side window the whole time. He was parked nowhere near me, and the wind chill was below zero as well, so he had to have made a point to walk by my car like that. I was terrified. With my hands shaking, I started my car and drove home as fast as I could, calling my boyfriend on the way and crying. After that, I decided finally I needed to talk to my professor about what was going on. I was extremely nervous, but I asked her the next week if I could talk to her privately when the class was over. We went over to her office, and I told her all about Eddie and what he had done, and how he was acting weird toward me. She told me she had noticed that I tensed up and went quiet whenever he got close to me, and had noticed him paying a lot of attention to me as well. She told me she believed me about the pictures. She was honestly amazing with how she handled all this. She promised me she would move things around to where I'd be away from him in the lab. She asked if I wanted her to talk to him about it as well. I said no. I didn't want to make him angrier than he already was, and she said she'd respect that. She was going to have the security guard stand at the door though and watch me go to my car every night. She'd tell the program director as well what was going on, but Eddie wouldn't know that I had talked to her. By the time we got all this done, it had been 30 minutes since class had ended. She offered to walk me outside together. I'm glad that she did, because the moment we came out of the elevator to the first floor, Eddie was sitting there in the foyer all alone. Every single other person had gone home. My blood immediately ran cold, but I tried my best to act as normal as I could. He seemed quite surprised to see our professor there as well, as she was to see him. When she asked him why he was still there after so long, he said he'd noticed my car was still parked out front and wanted to make sure I wouldn't have to walk out by myself. I'm pretty sure I must have been pale as a ghost, but my professor gave him a look I couldn't read and said not to worry. She was walking me to my car, and from now on the security guard would be there every single night. He quickly said that was good and walked away saying good night. It still gives me chills to think about what could have happened if my professor didn't walk me down to my car that night. I have no idea what he was capable of doing. After this, she rearranged our seating and made sure we were never grouped together. I started making sure I walked out to my car at the same time as a few other women in my class as well. The security guard was usually in the foyer by then. We only had a couple months left of this class as well, so there wasn't really much time for any other incidents. I would still catch him staring at me sometimes though, and giving me looks of pure rage. It's been a few years since then. I don't go to that school anymore and I'm moving to a completely different city soon. I'm a lot more assertive and stronger now, but I still hope I never meet Eddie ever again. this happened earlier last year, and it still fucks me up if I even think about it too much. Ugh. For a little background story to explain, I'm a delivery driver for Uber Eats, and I've been doing it as a side gig for the past year or so to earn some extra money. Also, I'm a female. Anyway, yeah, Uber Eats. It's a super chill job, although the pay is definitely not ideal, especially during nights. Normally, any pings I get after 10pm are just shitty fast food orders to customers where the chances of being tipped are even lower than what they already are, which is low in and of itself. I would say only 2 in 10 people tip on Uber Eats, but whatever. Anyway, yeah, late night deliveries very rarely profitable, which is why I would very rarely ever do them. However, on this night last year, there happened to be a big bonus going on reach 15 deliveries in a certain time frame to get an extra 75 bucks. Well, that's music to my ears. When that's the case, late night deliveries rock, because there's no traffic at all, and it doesn't matter where you're picking up from either. McDonald's schmickdonald's bring on the bonuses. The faster you can get them done, the faster you can get home and knock out. Open roads all the way works just fine for me. I was on a big roll and finished my last Mickey D's run at 2.30 in the morning. 
I cashed in my bonus and called it a night. For context, this took place in downtown San Diego. Downtown San Diego has fun restaurants and clubs at the core, but as you branch out it gets a lot more seedy. Once you arrive past 16th Street, it gets really, really sketchy. Lots of homeless camps, the whole works. I tried to actively avoid that area, but in order to get back home and on the freeway, I had to pass through that neighborhood at least a little. One more piece of info, I drive a 2002 shitty Ford Focus, and nothing is automatic. In order to roll the windows up or down, you have to reach over and crank the lever. Because it's a hassle to roll them up and down manually each time, when I do deliveries, I usually just keep both my windows rolled down. It's easier to pick up and deliver through windows that way. This night, fuck me, I had the windows down as usual. I was planning on rolling them up before I passed 16th Street where the homeless camp was, but I didn't even get that far. As I turned down a side street heading toward the main drag, up ahead I see a man in one of those orange reflective construction vests standing off to the side of the road. There's always some sort of construction going on downtown, and it's pretty common for it to happen at night when most people aren't using the roads, so I didn't really think too much of this. As I began to get closer, the man sprinted into the middle of the street and began waving his arms signaling for me to stop. I started to slow down, thinking maybe he was going to redirect traffic or reroute me or something. I broke down to 10 miles per hour, then 5, leaving distance to figure out what I'm supposed to do in this moment. He breaks out into a jog towards my car though and stops directly in front of it, blocking me and my car from moving forward. Fuck. Immediate unease. This is too weird. I wished I had remembered to roll my windows up. It was 3 a.m. on a dark street, and there was not a soul around except me and this dude. People talk about fight or flight, and I've always wondered how I would react in a situation that warranted a similar response. Now I know my reaction is to freeze, because as I was slowing down, it hit me five seconds later than it should have. This guy was obviously not a construction worker. Yes, he did have on a hard hat and a vest. And also the creepiest smile I had ever seen in my life now that he had caught me. At first glance, I thought he was smiling just to be friendly. But smiling to acknowledge someone longer than a few seconds is super unnerving. Just try it right now. Count to five in your head while grinning like a madman and you'll see what I mean. That's what this guy was doing. Now that he was directly in front of me, I could tell he must be homeless. Older guy, I would guess in his 60s. But homelessness has a special way of making everyone look old, so who knows really. Now he was just staring at me, wild-eyed and smiling, all teeth. His smile and mannerisms, the best way I can describe it is twisty from American Horror Story. Literally though, I could just tell from looking at him that this guy was having an episode. I obviously should have reversed in that moment, but my brain was panicking and I couldn't think that fast. I was frozen in my car, thinking this would be the moment I would die. The whole time he did not say a single thing. He just stood there leering. All of a sudden, like a movie ninja, he hopped up onto the hood of my car and began slamming his fist down on my hood and windshield. I was frozen in terror, just watching this man pounding on my car crawling around on his hands and knees like the grudge. He's not saying anything either. He's just crawling and staring at me. That was the most horrifying part. Somehow he never once broke eye contact during all of this and never stopped grinning either. The thought of my window still being open made me want to throw up, but at the same time breaking eye contact and moving to roll them up felt a lot scarier. Like if I made any sudden moves or looked away, it would be the perfect time for him to try to come inside the car and strike. Still, he never uttered a single sound. I think it would have been less scary if he had said anything, but he didn't. He just pounded his fists on the car and stared. In all reality, this whole encounter probably lasted 15 seconds, but it felt like I was stuck there for days. I was freaking out, and before I could gain the sense to do anything remotely intelligent, I saw headlights in my rearview mirror coming up from behind me down the street. The man saw this too, and in an instant, he leapt off of my car and broke off in a run behind me, heading straight towards the new car. Jesus Christ, what the hell is this? 
I floored it and didn't look back until I was halfway home on the freeway. At this point, it was all adrenaline. For a long time after that, I stopped delivering at night altogether. I sure as hell don't go down to that section of downtown anymore. Instead, I just take the longer route home. I also don't drive with the windows down at night if it's an area that's even remotely run down. What I realized from this is how naive I could be to just automatically trust and obey someone just because they have a uniform on. I didn't even question slowing down at first, even though the whole situation was sketchy as fuck. It was actually quite the opposite. In my mind, I was comforted by the fact that now somebody trustworthy was on the road. I guess my subconscious thoughts went like, oh nice, a public servant doesn't want me making a wrong turn. By the time I stopped, it would have already been too late if this guy wanted to attack me. I shudder thinking about it. I calmed down eventually by reassuring myself this was just probably a crazy dude on drugs who meant no harm. Hopefully, that is the case. And for my own peace of mind, I'm going to choose to believe that it is. But what got to me is the fact that this guy was dressed as a road worker, on the road, and deliberately behaving at first in a way to lead me to believe he was one. Why else wear that getup? And why were you trying to pull cars over? Just to freak people out? I don't know the answer. And I'm glad I didn't find out what it was he really wanted from me. Fucking yikes. There's this hotel by the Bulgarian seaside, in which we have an apartment. To be honest, that's a very strong word for it. It's basically just a big room with a giant bed, refrigerator, and big windows on both of the walls. I guess it also has a small bathroom as well. It's on the ground floor, and again, both of the walls are facing the parking lot of the hotel. Despite all of this though, it's perfect for me alone. It's situated right next to the beach, and that's why I've been spending some of my summer vacations there recently. So, July three years ago, I'm spending a week with my ex-boyfriend there, and three to four weeks alone by myself after that. My ex always said that the owners of the hotel were a bunch of creeps. Whenever we went out of the room, he had to walk a path passing through the reception, where they used to sit all day doing nothing. The old dad in his 60s, I guess, his son Crum, who was about 40, and his daughter, who was 45. Her husband would also sometimes join them. When you'd pass by, they'd just all get silent immediately and stare at you. Every single time. I was used to this behavior after a while, but the boyfriend was very irritated, especially when he caught Crum staring at my ass and smiling. After that, he used to stare him down deadly right in the eyes whenever he got the chance. Soon, my ex went back to the city. It was now the third week I'd been alone. The night was extremely hot, so I opened both windows wide open and put the curtains above them to defend myself from being peeked at. After all, I was at the ground level and my bed was right below both of the windows. I woke up in the middle of the night and suddenly felt like someone was watching me. This happened for the next few nights as well, I'm easily scared and paranoid, but I was alone there, so I had been telling myself to chill out. It must just be my crazy mind trying to scare itself. Some nights went by without problem. Meanwhile, Crum tried to talk to me two to three times when I was off to the beach. It was around 1am now. I was falling asleep when I began to hear footsteps outside the path. It was not exactly strange. There were some people staying next to me at the same kind of apartment. Maybe someone was coming home or going out partying late at night. Then though, the steps stopped really close by outside. I could hear all of this because of the opened windows. I was sitting in the bed now and listening when I noticed that the door handle was moving slowly up and down. I lost my shit but stayed quiet. I silently thanked myself for remembering to lock the door before I'd gone to bed. After a while of silently jimmying the handle, Nothing happened and the person walked away. I closed the windows after that. I called my dad and told him what just happened. He told me to lock and close everything and he'd come grab me in the morning. It's a five hour drive. This was three years ago. Last night we were having dinner together and my dad said, 
Hey, do you remember your sea adventures? He proceeded to tell me he had made his own little investigation back in the day and asked the owners of the hotel for security camera records. They checked the ones in the parking lot and saw a male figure skulking around. The part with the door handle was not in the camera range, unfortunately. My dad remembers my strange midnight waking up routine and told them to check the older records as well. In each of them, they saw a man peeking through my windows, trying to grab through the curtains, standing like that for 15 to 20 minutes each time. The woman finally recognized her brother and told my dad he had mental disabilities. She begged him not to press any charges and that they'd promised to take better care of him and look after him from then on. My dad, being a good guy, did not press charges. It appears that now we're selling the apartment. So, anyone interested in buying, perhaps? I was 19 years old, and the only female working at a shop specializing in automotive batteries and things of that nature. I had been working there long enough to realize that most of the clientele was male, and oftentimes that made for some awkward situations. For instance, I would get talked down to and patronized quite a bit, or flirted with to the point where I would be somewhat uncomfortable. I have a really thick skin though, thankfully, so most of the time I typically wasn't very bothered. One day, during a particularly busy rush, a very tall and well-built man who was maybe in his mid-thirties, came in through my line. I consider myself to be pretty good at reading people, and this guy was giving off some very, very strange vibes. Something about him seemed a little bit off. However, it was my job to be professional and assist whoever came through my line regardless, so I brushed aside those uneasy feelings. I just wanted to ring this guy out and get through the rest of the line that was now trailing out the front door. I greeted and talked to him as I would any other customer while I was processing his transaction. Things were going pretty fine actually, until he realized I was almost done. He started stalling and making up weird excuses as to why he couldn't use certain credit cards. Now he needed me to put his battery on hold. He would come back later, etc. I told him I would hold it for him and he could come back whenever he found the time in the future. I figured he would just leave at that point, but instead he stood there and stared at me. Now that I think about it, it was more like he was staring through me rather than at me. I was a bit uneasy, but I kept my polite and professional demeanor. Uh, sir, if you're not purchasing anything at the moment, may I ask you to please step aside so that I can assist all these other customers? He completely disregarded my question, though, and in a slow, raspy voice, he asked, So, what's your name? I didn't wear a name tag specifically for reasons like this. Customers had found me on Facebook before in the past, and it was quite unsettling. Thinking quickly, I threw out my nickname instead. It's Rhea. Rhea, he said as he kept on staring through me. I smiled awkwardly. Yep, that's me. By this point, my manager had realized what was going on and proceeded to ask the man to step aside as well. After hearing it from my manager, the man walked to a corner of the store by some shelving and continued to stare while I rung the rest of the customers out. A bit of time went by and the line had since cleared up, but he was still standing there staring and now smiling the most sickening smile I think I've ever seen. It made my skin crawl. Of course, my manager and co-worker saw this as well. My co-worker grabbed my arm and said, Come on, dude, let's go to the back instead. As we were walking into the stock room, my manager walked over to ask the man if there was anything else he needed. The man muttered that there wasn't and left. I wish that was the end of it but of course he had to come back in to purchase the battery. When he came back the next day, we again had a long line. He even let people go ahead of him and waited until I was completely free before coming up to the counter to make his purchase. I greeted him again and tried my best to remain professional, 
but it was hard considering how creeped out by this guy I was. I was met again with that same vacant stare and that freaky fucking smile. I can't remember exactly the entire conversation, but at some point the questions he was asking became weird and inappropriate enough for my coworker to cut in on my behalf. He looked at the guy, then over at me. Hey Rhea, why don't you go take your break instead? He basically pushed me out of the way and rang the guy out instead of me. I stayed in the back until my manager came and got me, telling me it was safe to come out. We were all pretty weirded out by this, but of course, that would be the end of it, right? A few days went by. We had all mostly forgotten about this creepy dude, until he walked in again. This time, though, he didn't even look through the store. He didn't approach the counter. He didn't say a single word to anyone. He just stood in the back, pulled his hood up over his head, and hid in the very corner of the store, staring at me and smiling. His smile had become even wider and more sinister looking. At this point, I really started to freak out. I started shaking and feeling sick to my stomach. My manager came and screamed at the guy. Hey you, I'm sick of you coming into my store and pulling this crap. If you're not going to buy anything, get out. The creep paid him no mind though. He kept on staring at me. This of course pissed my manager off. He walked out from around the corner and told the dude, Look, man, if you don't quit coming in here and staring, I will not hesitate to call the cops. What you're doing is harassment, so get the hell out of my store! At the mention of the police, this dude's smile turned into a snarl, and he slowly sauntered out of the store. We never saw him again after that, but I was immediately taken off closing shifts, due to the fear that the man would come back and try to catch me when I was there alone. I've definitely dealt with my fair share of creeps at that job, but this guy was by far the most disturbing. My junior year of college, I moved into a large house with four people on the first floor, five on the second, and two people upstairs who we didn't really talk to. This house was very old, but it seemed normal enough at first glance at least until I went down to the basement for the first time. There was this washing machine and dryer down there that never worked, so we had no real reason to ever go down there except for parties. The weirdest part of this room was towards the back of the basement. It was always locked, and it always gave me an overwhelming sense of fear any time I even got near it. Apparently, when my roommates had first moved in, that room was not locked. One of the girls had been looking around in there and found several human teeth and what she described as strange tools. Not too long after that, the landlord, who had only just recently purchased the property, locked up that door, and it had never been opened since. Fast forward a few months. I had recently woken up from a nap and was cooking some food on the stove. I was the only person there on our floor. Suddenly, the hallway light to my left turned off with no warning. I shrugged, assuming the light must have burnt out on its own. Then, though, it turned back on. The light switch for that light was on the stairwell on the other side of a closed door, so I waited for a minute, only for the light to turn off by itself again. I ran over to the door quickly and threw it open, thinking someone had to be fucking with me. But no one was there. I walked downstairs. There was nobody on that floor either. Now, I was a little freaked out. I still just told myself, though, it must be an electrical problem or something. I go back to making my food. Immediately, the light turns off and on again. I kind of stood there for a few seconds. Then, music started to play. It was coming from the living room, which was right next to the kitchen, out of sight. Now, I was feeling relieved, thinking someone must have been home after all. I walked out into the living room, only to see a closed laptop. Sitting on a ledge near the window, connected to some speakers, the television was on one of those static channels, just like in the movies. I slowly walked toward the speakers, when I realized the laptop had been turned off. I unplugged them, and the music stopped. I really wish I could remember what song was playing, but I obviously had other thoughts in my mind in that moment. That was when the chills sunk in. 
I turned off the stove, walked down the stairs, got in my car, and drove away. A few weeks later, I told my roommates about what had happened, hoping someone would confess to the very elaborate prank they had just pulled on me. Instead, though, every single person got kind of quiet, and each one, one by one, started admitting to weird shit that had happened to them, too. One of the girls claimed that she would often wake up in the middle of the night and hear noises coming from inside her closet. Sometimes, the hangers would move around like someone had just bumped into them, Another friend said he often heard weird noises, like footsteps above him. When he walked upstairs, though, nobody was home. Another guy told us he had woken up in the middle of the night to see a dark figure standing right in the center of our kitchen, staring into his room, before it walked into the stairwell and disappeared from his sight. A little late to the thread, so this might not get too many reads, but I'll post this anyways. So, when I was 7 or 8 years old, I went over to a friend's house after school. My friend's house was located on a relatively quiet street and had a large backyard surrounded by woods. Well, my friend and I decided it'd be a good day to build a tree fort. We'd build it out in the woods behind his house. We rounded up some of the necessary tools and brought his little brother to tag along as well. Some background to the story, there had recently been some daytime coyote spotting in the area, so we were nervous already to begin with. I even remember discussing with my friend and his younger brother our plan to smash any attacking coyotes with a hammer. In retrospect, that probably wouldn't have worked too well, but like I said, we were all very little kids. As we were walking along the path out into the woods, I can vividly remember looking down at the trail while walking and conversing with my friend, when all of a sudden my friend's younger brother stopped dead in his tracks and remained standing there motionless. Before I even knew what was going on, I noticed my friend also stop suddenly, so naturally I did the same. I looked up to see just what it was that was frightening them. I can still very clearly remember this image. I could see in the middle of the woods, there was this older woman, I'd guess mid to late 70s if we had to say an age. She had this waving curly grayish white hair and was dressed in a white gown. She was roughly 25 yards ahead of us, just standing there. She wasn't moving, completely motionless, not even looking at us, but rather directly through us, if that makes any sense. I still get the chills even thinking of that image now but it's still so clear in my mind. What I'm about to say next might seem like a little bit of a stretch, and it was more than likely my imagination getting the better of me. However, I swore there was like a faint aura of white around the woman. My friends and I have also since discussed this incident, and they too described some sort of light radiating off of her. After standing paralyzed for what seemed like several moments, we watched as the woman slowly raised her right arm and pointed the direction in which we'd come and started walking slowly towards us. Almost immediately, just like a scene from a movie, we all screamed and dropped our tools, nails, and pieces of woods for the treehouse. We sprinted back towards my friend's house. All of us frantically told my friend's mom what we'd seen, but to no one's surprise she just dismissed it as childhood imagination. We're all now over 20 years old, and we're still in agreement that we saw a glowing white-haired woman dressed in a white gown in the middle of the woods that day.